Ukraine on Fire Critique, a deeply flawed movie by The Right Podcast. Much to my dismay, after getting into recording, I found that this was uh, going to be a very long video, uh, like the last one was. So you might hear me throughout say, okay, I'm going to speed up. And then uh, I've just given up on it because I want this to be self-contained. I don't want it to be part one, part two, part three. I want this all one shebang. So that's what we're doing. And it's going to be long. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with someone throwing stuff against the wall and tying yarns, red yarn strings uh, to it, uh, you know, it's a conspiracy thing. There's lots of propaganda. There's lots of history. There uh, are there's much more left out than there is actually in it. There are many lies by omission. So it's going to be a, a long video. So buckle in. All right. I hope you like these. So what, what's the purpose of this? Okay. Number one, I'm not going to talk about Oliver Stone like as a person. I'm not going to attack him. I'm not going to uh, attack the director. I'm not going to uh, even necessarily um, say that you know Ukraine is right. Because, I mean, this movie is basically saying a lot of horrible things about Ukraine. And I'm not here to say that Ukraine is perfect or that there aren't bad elements in Ukraine. What I'm hoping this video will do is provide context, historical accuracy, um, voices that are purposefully left out to provide you all with a better sense of reality as opposed to a narrative. And ultimately that's what this is. Right, this, this is a movie, it's not a documentary. Uh, what you're seeing is a narrative. It, it, this is not a historical timeline or a discussion of historical events in chronological order. Uh, the, these are cherry picked incidents that are oftentimes re presented in the form of half truth or again, lies by omission, um, put back together into this Frankenstein thing that uh, makes a point for which Oliver Stone wanted to make before even engaging in the film, if that makes sense. He worked backwards. If this were a, a research paper, this would be an F, right? So uh, that's the point of this. It's so that when you all see stuff on Twitter or whatever social media that you're on, and you know, you're saying, wow, that doesn't seem right, or uh, wow, that seems like really pro-Russia, not that. Russia is any worse than another country per se, but that seems really biased or, or weird. Um, or if you're surprised at some of the things that maybe your, uh, you know, accounts that, that pose as being leftist are, are saying, uh, now you'll, you'll understand why, right? A, a lot of it comes from this film, and, and that gets to the next point. Why critique a film that's years old now? What's the point? Because this is very influential, whether people realize it or not. Uh, there are many people who I've talked to and engaged with who are, you know, genuinely uh, trying to, to do the right thing. Um, they have good intentions, but, uh, you know, they've, they've watched this and they've, they've engaged with a lot of questionable people and alt imperialists. And um, so the things that they're saying just don't make, first of all, it's not an opinion of disagreement. It's that the things that they're saying just don't make sense. Like historically, they don't line up correctly right so i'm hoping that by addressing this movie which is often directly referenced and oftentimes by people with good intentions but i think equally if not more just in general influential right and and many themes and ideas have arisen from this that are are now just a part of the zeitgeist right i hope that by going back and addressing the the root of this right the root cause of this film that people will, again, have a better understanding of the totality of events. And then from there can make a decision. This is not a pro-US video. This is not a pro-NATO video. It's not pro-EU. This is not about capitalism is good or communism is good or socialism. It's none of that stuff. This is just, here's the movie. Here's all the stuff the movie left out on purpose to make, you know, because if they include it, it, it would have messed up the story. And this is a story. It's not a documentary, right? So we're going to talk about all the stuff that's not included in it. And then we'll also talk about the things that are included in it that aren't entirely correct. 
And that is all that we're doing, right? Oliver Stone is could be a very nice man. I have no idea. I'm not here to, to bash him personally. I'm not here to change minds about theories or, or economic stances or political ideas. What I'm here to do is just provide facts about this film, its inaccuracies, and all of the things that are left out. And what you do with that is ultimately up to you. I'm not going to push you in any direction. That's not the point. There's no conclusion that says, therefore, Russia's evil or something like that. That's not the point. All right. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about the imagery in the beginning of this. We'll talk about the history, inaccuracies, and things that are left out. Uh, Khrushchev is kind of a bridge into maybe more modern takes. Uh, we'll briefly talk about language. And then we're going to get to some of the people that are involved with this. Victor uh, Yanukovych. Yulia Moshenko, the European Association Agreement, and the Maidan protests. Then we'll move into the transition of power. We're going to talk about Russian NGOs and media because that's not discussed in this, but Western American NGOs and media are. We'll address the Newland call. You'll know what that is if you don't know already. We're going to talk about the sacred victim myth, which I just, this is subjective. I found this personally egregious. Uh, we'll talk about the Crimean referendum and Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, along with a lot of other things that are just you know, too many to make a bullet list. But these are the, the big the big picture things. So let's get into it. Right. Again, I'm going to do my best to keep it moving, but there's a lot to get to when people just, you know, throw stuff against the wall. It takes much longer to take it down than it does to throw it up there. And, and that's what we're doing now. One of the things that. Um, if you want to have an honest critique of this movie, one of the things that you have to understand is that the history is not um, accurate and it's devoid of context, meaning anything that's contradictory to the story that Stone wants to provide is just completely left out. It, it's not even as if it's included in kind of like a fake and dismissive way, maybe like a token Democrat on a Fox News show or something. Contrary voices are just not included, right? This is pure propaganda. It's fictional and it's a story. And you, you need to understand these things about this before moving forward. I will get into exactly why, right? But the history is specifically egregious and it's specifically egregious because there are pieces of it, like any good conspiracy that are true. However, those pieces that are true are presented in ways that are not factual, are devoid of context, and most importantly, just leave stuff out. And by leaving stuff out, you're creating a lie by omission. If I tell you that it rains every Wednesday, the causation of rain is Wednesday. If I tell you that clouds create rain, and that it's been cloudy for the past three Wednesdays, it's no longer Wednesday that's the causation. And that's what this movie is about. It's leaving out all the other stuff to create causation of neocons and fascists working together and tying any type of Ukrainian sovereignty, territorial integrity, cultural independence, ethnic independence, any anything that makes Ukraine unique and separate from Russia, right? To, the purpose of this movie is to tie both those things, one, to Western neocons, as well as fascism. And that's why history is included in the movie. It's not included to talk about history. Pieces of history are cherry-picked to help create this story. So around four minutes in, what we see is an attempt to combine um, 1941 with 2014. Um, up to this point, I think, you know, we've seen a lot of, of tying neocons to the Maiden protest. But, uh, it, you know, the, the, the other goal, the, the second or equally as important goal is to tie um, 2014 to, to 1941. This is not just straight Russian propaganda. It's also the stuff of extremism. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, this imagery is multi-pronged, right? First, it is supposed to um, burn into the viewers' minds uh, that Nazis are associated with Ukrainian nationalism. Second, um, it's supposed to not just tie 
but to make the same, right? To, to make Nazism and, and Ukrainian nationalism not just tied to each other, but essentially part of the same ideology. And last, it attempts to undermine the Maidan protests by linking an extremely small percentage of the overall protesters to extremist groups. Those extremist groups uh, are then tied to Nazism, thereby claiming um, that the entire exercise was invalid and justified Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right. So, so that's the that's the point of this. They don't necessarily come out and say that, but it's it's pretty in your face, and and that's that's the point, right? Um, 2014 was neocons in the U.S. funding a group of far right Ukrainian um, Nazis, and um, Ukrainian Nazis are tied to Ukrainian nationalism per World War II. That's the fake um, story that Oliver Stone. Is going to tell you basically for you know the, the remainder of this this film. Um, around the seven minute mark, uh, it stated that the truth is Ukraine has never been a united country. And if I mean I'm sorry, if you hear somebody say that, and you keep watching, believing that what what you're listening to is accurate, I kind of don't know what to say. It, it's it's. Even if you don't know the history of the region, and this is critical thinking, right? I mean, you have to know that that's ridiculous. But anyway, it's more than just ridiculous, right? I mean, uh, it's a lie. It's an opinion. Um, it's not the truth as it's presented. But you know, even prior to the concept of nation states, right? I mean, let, let's go back in history because Oliver Stone does that. Ukraine has always been a sovereign, independent, separate culture, language. Um, if we're looking at, at, at paths of civilizations, going back to the Kiev and Rus in the medieval period, or if we're talking about um, ties to Polish rule, if we're talking about um, you know, very old Lithuanian uh, horde empires, Kiev has consistently been on a different track than Moscow. And that track has been closer tied to Europe. That's history. Now it gets more complicated in the modern era and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. But this idea that U Ukraine has never been an independent country is false. And you know, it's, not just, it's not just propaganda to try to um, undermine and dismiss Ukrainian nationalism, right? It, it, it is that, that's part of its, it, its utility, but uh, it's also beyond that. It, it also ties into beyond just, just government propaganda uh, to justify the invasion of a, of a sovereign country. Uh, it, it, it also delves into extremism. Now, I have a video on uh, Russian extremists in Donbass, I have a video on national Bolshevism that, that eventually gets to Alexander Dugin and fourth position politics. These ideas of a Eurasian imperialist empire uh, being tied to um, ethnic uh, uh, Slavic ties by, by ignoring territorial integrity, right? By, by ignoring borders and, and looking at these broader scopes of race and, and things like that. This is the stuff of, of extremists, and, and I'll get into that more later, but it's important for you to know this, right? This isn't just political propaganda to, to acquire land, to gain access to ports, um, to, to gain raw materials, things like that, right? This is ideological extremism, and it's not just ideological because there are paramilitaries and extremist groups that are active and have been active in Russia that promote this type of ideology. And it's vital for you to know that Putin himself has promoted this ideology so that it isn't just a few people in, in the basement. This extremism has become part of the foreign policy of Russia. And, and you can read this the article by Vladimir Putin I have here. You can read that and then you can read, or if you don't wanna read 900 pages of one book and essentially yell over another, you can watch the video I made on 
national Bolshevism and uh, skip to the part of Alexander Dugan and see that um, these things are tied together. Then jump over to the video I have on Russian extremists, look at Russian imperial movement, look at Russian unity, um, look at the uh, Wagner group, look at um, Special Task Force Ruzik, look at the Black Hundreds and, and uh, all these paramilitary groups um, and extremist groups. And you'll see that they are tied and they are connected. So ironically, right, this movie is supposed to be showing you how the idea of an independent Ukraine equals Nazism and neocons, right? But I, I, what it's really promoting is this extremist, imperialistic Eurasian project that is not only propaganda, but in and of itself extremist, based in cultural, ethnic, and a lot of really bad stuff that I talked about in other videos. Okay, so now that we understand just how extreme some of these ideas are that, that we're talking about here from the Russian side, Right, because none of this is discussed. Right? We all we we know all about Ukraine. We don't know any of this stuff about Russia because that would contradict the fake narrative that this story is trying to create. All right, let's get more specific though. Around um, the ten minute mark or so, it says the movie states a large portion of Ukrainians welcomed Nazi rule. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, did some Ukrainians welcome Germany into Ukraine during World War II? Yes. Did some Ukrainians welcome Germany into Ukraine in World War I? Yes. Why, why was World War I left out? And, and forget about ancient history, right? And forget about like Kiev and Rus. Let's just, this is about Nazis because it's trying to discredit Ukrainian nationalism by saying it's all Nazis, which is, hilarious. But why didn't Oliver Stone tell, inform the viewer, if we're, if we're only talking about modern history, why didn't he inform you that Ukrainian nationalists also saw allies in World War I with Central European powers, including Germany, but also the Austro-Hungarian Empire too? Well, because that would contradict the idea that Ukrainian nationalism and sovereignty is directly tied to Nazism. That's why he's telling you about what happened in World War II. But it's not the whole story. And it's a very different story if I tell you, look, there were fascists at Maiden, and they were, they were the driving force of it. You know, Ukrainian nationalists worked with Nazis in World War II. Right? That story leads the viewer to one conclusion. We could also talk about the whole story. We'll get to Maiden, but yes, there were some extremists at this protest, but they were comprised of under 10% of the total participants. And we'll get to that, that's a cited source. And yeah, some Ukrainian nationalists did collaborate with, with Nazi Germany in World War II because they were trying to gain independence from the Soviet Union, but I mean, Ukrainian nationalists also worked with Germany in World War I. And they worked with the Austro-Hungarian Empire too, because they looked at Central Europe as an opposing power that could help them gain independence from Russia in, in, in various forms, the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Those are two different stories, aren't they? I mean, it, this is one example of just how ridiculous this film is and how it can lead you to incorrect conclusions. Okay, and so why is everything Nazi, Nazi, Nazi? Well, I mean, obviously Nazis are horrible people and specifically they're horrible, well, for many reasons, but the Holocaust and the Holocaust included many different types of people. However, in general, maybe the, the main thrust were of course, Jewish people that were living in Germany. So let's talk about that. Atrocities against Jewish people. Have you ever heard of the term beyond the pale? Maybe you haven't, it's kind of an old term, but uh, where does that come from? Well, it comes from something called pale settlements. Pale settlements were specific areas where Jewish people were allowed to live. And where did they come from? Well, when Catherine the Great, leader of Russian empire, absorbed parts of Eastern Europe into her empire, she also absorbed a large contingent of Jewish people. 
So what's the problem with that? Jewish people were banned from living in Russia. Why? Because Russia was legally anti-Semitic. And so we had places that were created for Jewish people to live because Catherine the Great wanted the land, but she wasn't allowed to include Jewish people in Russia because of anti-Semitism. One of the largest geographic areas for pale settlements was Ukraine. Later, Russian pogroms would be placed against Jews in these regions that included beating, property confiscation, and murder. Hate groups formed, such as the Russian Black Hundreds, a name later adopted by Russian extremists attempting to stir discontent in Donbass post maidan protests. Pogroms included the Odessa pogroms, um, the Kiev pogroms, as well as others. In fact, it was this very treatment by the Russian Empire that facilitated or, or caused Jewish emigration into Central Europe, including Germany, before World War II. Peter the Great, a Russian leader that Putin just a few days ago likened to himself when he made in very clear language the statement that he is on an imperialistic message, right? Harkening back to Peter the Great, Putin himself. Peter the Great is quoted as saying about Jewish people, they are rogues and cheats. It is my endeavor to eradicate evil, not multiply it. So essentially remove Jewish people from Russia. Why didn't Albert Stone talk about this? I mean, he talked about things around this time period. He talked about history predating World War II, which is, you know, one of his benchmarks. Well, he didn't tell you about any of this stuff because it contradicts his message, right? His message is that it's Ukrainian nationalists that are anti-Semitic and that it's Russia who's actually fighting against these Nazis in Ukraine who just want an independent country. Well, it's a different story when you include all this other history too, right? And again, the purpose of this is not to say that Russia is anti-Semitic or that Ukraine doesn't have far-right extremists, but it's to provide you the truth, which is more than the pretend fake story that Oliver Stone is telling you. And this, these facts contradict a lot of the, the story that Stone is, is trying to present. You know, there, there are other things that, that he left out too. He didn't talk about the Haldemar, and it's, some, it's sometimes called the Ukrainian Holocaust. Translated, it roughly means to kill by starvation. It was a man-made famine which killed between 7 and 10 million people. And this was supported, uh, this, this, this statement, right, these facts, were supported by a joint statement to the United Nations signed by 25 countries. You'll find people, especially um, on the left, that will try to you know, diminish or, or dismiss this. It's a very similar conversation that you'll have if you're talking about the Irish potato famine with people that might be British apologists. Um, but the stories that you'll hear are that this is an unfortunate byproduct, right? That you know, this wasn't targeted, it was just Stalin trying to industrialize the country and this was an unforeseen byproduct of it. Well, I mean, that's one story that you can tell yourself. It's, pretty targeted and pretty specific and pretty drastic. Another story, right? we're talking about stories, is that Ukraine had just been reabsorbed into the Soviet Union after declaring itself independent, and that Stalin wanted to punish Ukrainian nationalists and wanted to beat independence and the idea that Ukraine could somehow separate from the Soviet Union into the ground, literally, by people being forced to do things like eat grass to survive. These are images from the Ukrainian Holocaust. And, you know, this one gets me specifically um, irked because I worked at, I've worked at many historical societies and one of them was a Ukrainian American historical society. It was actually during the time of the Orange uh, Revolution. And there was a traveling exhibit that talked about this event. And there were primary documents. There were pictures. 
there were diaries. And to see people dismiss it, um, yeah, it, 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 it makes me upset. Okay, so yes, there's a history of anti-Semitism in the area. <clears throat> no, it's not just specific to Ukraine. As a matter of fact, Ukraine was used as a geographic area for pale settlements because Jewish people couldn't even live in Russia, all right? Um, but getting more specific to World War II, because that's what Oliver Stone wants to talk about. He doesn't want to talk about these other things that contradict his story. All right, so getting specific about World War II without losing sight of the long history of anti-Semitic uh, actions of Russia that were conveniently left out um, is the idea of Ukrainian nationalists attempting to collaborate with Germany and, and Austria-Hungary and other central powers prior to World War II. Um, there were indeed some Ukrainian nationalists who sided with Nazi Germany. After having soft support from Austro-Hungarian and German forces in World War I to gain independence from Russia, Ukraine declared itself as an independent uh, state at the conclusion of the war. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the German stuff, right? I'll even give you a, a good source to, to check out for uh, videos. But, you know, this was not elaborated on at all. At the conclusion of the war, there, there was an independent country created, right? And this is not World War II. So this is not some Nazi organization. This is World War I we're talking about. The independent republic existed from uh, 1920 to 1922 or so as the Russian Civil War ended and powers from Moscow uh, were consolidated, so were the surrounding territories, including Ukraine. And it was after this reabsorption into the new Russian empire, the Soviet Union, that the Ukrainian famine occurred, which we just talked about. Um, some suggest it was planned. Um, some suggest it was planned to suppress Ukrainian nationalists seeking sovereignty because they had literally just done so. Okay, and, and so um, I, in good faith, I'm, I'm going to show you that in, in a video I created about the Azov Battalion and Ukrainian nationalism, I talked about um, some of these organizations, and, and here they are, right? And these are the ones that, uh, that Oliver Stone focused on, too. There's even some here that he didn't talk about, right? So I do talk about them in, in this other video on the Azov Battalion, so check that out. But... Uh, in all honesty, that's only a small part of that video too. And there's another content creator. Uh, I don't get paid, like I've never even talked to him, but he does really good videos on this era. It's called History Hustle. So if you're interested in a specific battalion, like the Nightingale Battalion, right, for instance, or um, SS Division Galicia, go, I, I would honestly suggest, if you don't wanna go look at the, the primary resources, cause I mean, you know, you might not have the time to, to go read through all these things. Go go check out History Hustle. Um, yeah, he does a pretty good job of, of showing the history, but also providing context without creating some type of narrative around it. This is not what Oliver Stone does. <laughs> Oliver Stone does the opposite. So <laughs> he doesn't do a very good job explaining what these things were, how people got wrapped up in them. Um, the actual numbers compared to the numbers of people who aren't participating in them, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the Oliver Stone stuff we can see here, this is directly from Ukraine on Fire, uh, is the, the opposite of the video that, that I created, as well as some of the contents that you can find. Um, History Hustle, again, I'm, the, the guy doesn't even know that I'm talking about, but, but he, does, he does good stuff. Okay. But let's get specific, right? Because I can talk about all these things, but if I if I tiptoe around the fact that there there were people in World War II, I mean, forgetting everything else that we talked about, forgetting the the Ukrainian famine, <laughs> forgetting about the different directions of Ukraine versus Moscow, forgetting about how Ukraine sought help before Nazis were even in power from central powers, including the Austro-Hungarian, forgetting all this other stuff that kind of you know, chips away at, at this false narrative. Um, there were people um, that were Ukrainian nationalists that, that worked with, with German Nazis. So let's talk about the organization. And, and the organization is OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. There were two. Um, I don't think that the movie discussed this. I, 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 and 
I'm looking at my notes here. Um, and I don't think that Stone, he might have mentioned that there are two, but he definitely did not explain the differences or the other organizations that existed. Uh, just so you know, OUN wasn't the only nationalist, Ukrainian nationalist organization. It wasn't even the biggest. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the uh, beginning, it was kind of like the smallest and the most extreme, but I digress. Within the Ukrainian nationalist community, there were various factions. Within this broader community, there was the OUN, or Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. To get more granular, within OUN, there was OUNM and OUNB, and these had to do with the leaders. And the OUNM was more moderate. OUNB was more radical. OUNM contained, honestly, more conservative, kind of older folks. OUNB was more revolutionary and radical and more of a, a younger movement. Um, the OUNB tried to portray Nazi Germany as a liberating force for Ukrainians, as, had, um, as other prior Ukrainian nationalists had done for central powers, like what we talked about. The leader for OUNM um, fought with the Austro-Hungarian military in World War I. Why? Because Ukraine has very often seen central powers as an avenue to freedom from Russia. Fast forward, and the EU agreement was very much about this. As much as it was against about any economic thing, it was about independence from Russia and looking at Europe to gain that independence. So the leader for the OUNM actually fought with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? He became the leader of OUN in 1939 hoping for a more moderate approach. Um, the members of OUN looked at fascism and they read stuff. Um, they specifically uh, called out Mussolini as an influential inspiration, but the organization did condemn Nazism. This idea of Germany in World War II being a stepping stone of independence for Ukraine was flatly rejected by Nazi leadership and many Ukrainian nationalists were sent to concentration camps. Um, this includes Stefan Bandera. What Stone left out was the fact that these were not the only organizations and they weren't even the majority organizations. They weren't the most meaningful organizations. Throughout the interwar years, the Ukrainian National Democratic Alliance was far more influential and dominated mainstream politics of the region. Why didn't Oliver Stone talk about that? Why didn't he go in depth about the Ukrainian National Democratic Alliance like he did with OUNB? Because it contradicts his fake story that he's trying to weave about Ukraine. So let's get into it. Let's talk about this organization that, that he just left out. Okay, so what was the UNDO? Um, the UNDO was the far more influential um, political party. It was really the, the majority party, especially during the, the interwar period, as stated before. Um, the UNDO protested acts of anti Semitism. It cooperated with Jewish representatives of the Polish parliament following a Polish pogrom against Jews, and yes, those existed too, Polish pogroms, those aren't discussed because the Ukrainians are the bad guys. This Ukrainian nationalist organization published an article called After the Jews Come Our Turn, in which it describes how anti-Semitism can, or potentially could, by extension, become anti-Ukrainianism. It condemned anti-Semitism and warned of again, how this could be turned into a, pro a program or pogrom against Ukrainian people. When the Soviets occupied Ukraine after the German invasion, they banned all legal political parties. The OUN being something of a terrorist organization, especially OUNB, had the infrastructure in place to flourish without any formal legitimate opposition. So in other words, Soviet suppression of political freedom in Ukraine empowered the OUNB to grow. It took away its, its largest competitor, which was UNDO. And, 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 and what were some of the, the concepts of this? Well, 
it was basically Western liberalism, um, promoted social democracy. It was a center left party. Oliver Stone doesn't tell you this stuff, right? He just tells you that Ukrainian nationalists are Nazis. Well, I mean, no, that's not accurate. And you know, since, since uh, Stone left this out, let's go a little bit more in depth. What else did the UNDO talk about? Well, they opposed terrorism. One of uh, the accusations made against OUNB specifically were terrorist acts against uh, Poland because Poland during this time uh, was owned part of Ukraine and you can call it what you want, occupation, et cetera. Um, the UNDO, essentially believed in parliamentary politics and it opposed all forms of terrorism, including OUN. It wanted a constitutional democracy. It was supported by Ukrainian women organizations. It supported Jewish civil rights. It declared loyalty to Poland, the Polish state upon the German invasion in World War II, not Nazis. The USSR, banned legal Ukrainian political parties, and I want to reiterate this, leaving OUN as the sole power, as the sole power, as the owner of Ukrainian nationalism. If this doesn't, if this alone doesn't change your mind, or if, if at this point you feel the need to go seek out UNDO and look for any well, th this, this person wrote an anti-Semitic letter who was a member or something to, to dismiss this. You got to take a deep breath and ask yourself, are you interested in the truth or are you interested in a narrative? Uh, again, I'll, I'll point you to History Hustle. They, they have a pretty good video um, on this topic that is pure history. Um, it's, it's no you know, op-ed or commentary, but building on what we just learned, right, about this, this Ukrainian nationalist organization that worked with Jewish people, that wrote things that, that condemned anti-Semitism, that looked to align with the Polish state to gain independence from Russia, not Nazi Germany, right, to, to build on that. The current president of Ukraine is Jewish. And there's already been counter arguments and, and you know, social media people could, could jump on this because they, they understand that this contradicts their message, right? These alt imperialists and you know what have you. But for people who don't know that, now you know, right? The, the current president of Poland or of Ukraine is, is Jewish. But more importantly, his grandfather fought with the Red Army against Nazis. He has great uncles who fought against Nazis in the Red Army. Many, many, many more Ukrainians, including Ukrainian nationalists, fought with the Red Army against Nazi Germany. Just to, statistically speaking, none of this is talked about in Oliver Stone's film. What is also not discussed is the forced participation by some Ukrainians in those German battalions. History also has, has a good video about that. Not everybody was jumping up and down to become a Nazi, right? It was complicated. But building off of this, because because again, Nazis are, are bad for many reasons, including their anti-Semitism. Look at that image on the right. Here, let me move. That's from Twitter. And this is supposed to be from a left-wing account. You know, th 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 this is supposed to be showing that, that Zelensky, who is Jewish, is a puppet for Russian power or, or Western powers. We see NATO and the US on the top. And then Israel, why Israel? Oh, well, because this is anti-Semitic propaganda. Yeah, Russia uses a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda against Ukraine. In the video that I created, Russia's extremists in Ukraine, Nazis in Donbass, there was one group in particular, Black 100, who got that name from a much older organization in Russia that was also anti-Semitic, that goes back in Russian history. Of course, you know, Oliver Stone doesn't talk about that, but this Black 100 iteration is 2014. And 
It was a Russian nationalist extremist group that worked in collaboration with the Russian secret services. Its members were arrested in, in Ukraine for um, organizing paramilitaries in Donbass and spreading anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Ukrainian uh, literature. And there are many, this is just one example. There are many more examples and I talk about this in that video. So if you wanna know more about it, watch Russian extremists in Ukraine, Nazis in Donbass. So moving on to about the 15 minute mark, and I'm saying that because uh, I'm going to move at somewhat of a, a faster clip here to respect the time of, of this video and, and your listening time. Uh, but around the 15 minute mark, uh, Khrushchev is introduced and long story short, the way that Stone presents this is that um, Khrushchev is a benevolent leader of the Soviet Union who had a deep love and fondness for Ukraine. And due to that, he gave Ukraine um, the territory of Crimea. And that, that's a good story. And it, it, it's, a, it's a nice story for Stone because it plays into the narrative that essentially Russia is this benevolent force, right? But it, it also uh, plays into a narrative that, that Crimea really isn't part of Ukraine. And that's important because Oliver Stone has to justify the um, annexation of Crimea later by Russia. So, so this is a way for him to do that. Basically, that, that Crimea was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, Khrushchev was just a nice guy that you know liked Ukraine like most Russians do, and, and therefore he gave Ukraine this territory. And there might be some truth to that. There are documents that exist um, from Khrushchev's family that talk about his fondness for, for the region. But there, there's another part of this too that um, Oliver Stone leaves out. And so the, the part that he leaves out has to do with the population of people that were living in Crimea. Remember those pale settlements that we talked about of, of Jewish populations and settlements in Ukraine? Well, Crimea was also one of those pale settlements too. And uh, there was a, another ethnic minority that lived in Crimea and these were the Crimean Tartars. So around 1944, the Soviet state ordered forced deportation of ethnic Crimean Tartars and essentially engaged in what could only be called cultural genocide thereafter, um, erasing their religion, which is based in Islam, um, cultural uh, phenomena, institutions, um, buildings, etc. Cattle trains were used to deport women and children and elderly. And once this population was deported, and if you're watching the video, you, you can see that there's a, a graph here that shows the, the population decline in, in the region and, and how it um, coincides with a large increase of ethnic Russian people in this region. Well, in, in, in this specific, and you can see this is a, an ongoing event, but in, in this specific um, events that we're talking about, which is the, the forced deportation, the, the use of cattle trains to forcibly remove people from the region. Once this population was forcibly removed, it was replaced with ethnic Russians. And so this is important, not, not to just say Russia's bad or something, but because it adds a wrinkle to this narrative about Khrushchev just being this benevolent, happy person that, that loves Ukraine. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that Ukraine had uh, attempted to declare independence. And it wasn't that long ago that the Russian Civil War had ended and that the Soviet Union had forcibly reabsorbed Ukraine into what was then the Soviet Union. So this could, in a way, um, assist at destabilizing or at least undoing what might be considered a unified front against the Soviet Union or Russia by introducing all of this, all of these new people, all this huge new population, which is now part of Ukraine. This huge population of people are now Ukrainians. However, even though they are Ukrainians, they are ethnically Russian and they speak Russian and all of their ties, all their, their cultural ties, right? Their, their historical ties, their familial ties go back to Russia, not Ukraine. So 
there could have been another reason for Khrushchev to combine Crimea with Ukraine that was less benevolent in nature. And of course, none of this is discussed in, in the Stone uh, movie because it, go, it goes against the narrative that, that he's trying to construct. You also need to know that, and, and we'll get to the, the actual event more in depth later, because chronologically it's not at this part of the, the movie, but you need to know that the remaining pop population of Crimean Tartar people um, did not participate in the Crimean referendum. Um, and I have an image here if, if you're watching it, but uh, essentially they called this uh, a Russian occupation of the autonomous Republic of Crimea. And they uh, were not going to participate in that referendum because they did not see it as being legitimate. Again, this is just something that was uh, convenient, conveniently left out of, of the Stone movie. Um, something else that, that you need to know um, about this, this population of people that weren't really discussed in, in the Stone film. If you're watching the, the video, you, you can see I have an image up. It's titled, Holding Russian Constitutional Referendum in Crimea is a Crime. And this is dated back in uh, January of, of 2020. And, and essentially what this is showing is that the, the representation for the remaining population, the modern population of Crimean Tartar people in Crimea uh, boycotted the Crimean referendum. And they did so because they, first of all, said that it was invalid to begin with, but also because it was done during occupation of Russian forces. Now, we'll get to the Crimean referendum later. However, it's important for you to know that this population of people who were persecuted by the Soviet Union forcibly removed, thousands of people died, 8,000 people in transit, and then were replaced with ethnic Russians while this region being incorporated into Ukraine. It's important for you to know that um, the, the people who still live there, the remaining people in the modern era, um, did not physically, numerically, what that meant officially for Ukraine. Moving past um, th this, this Khrushchev era and, and Crimea and all the history that, that was devoid and, and, and skipped, we, we move forward to the, the Gorbachev era and specifically the foreign policy of Perestroika. And the way that, that the Stone documentary presents Perestroika was something of like a benevolent um, bumbling that was taken advantage of by extremists, which uh, is not accurate. And, and so the idea was that along with Glasnost and some other policies that these countries that had been absorbed by the Soviet Union, whether you're talking about the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, all the way down to Ukraine and all the territories in between, essentially the road to Berlin from Moscow in World War II, right? So all that these countries would, would be able to uh, seek independence um, from, the Soviet Union, and that's exactly what happened. And as a matter of fact, most countries did so very, very quickly. So there's that. This wasn't some type of benevolent bumbling. It's to me, I see it trying to be um, portrayed in, in a similar way as, as Khrushchev was being portrayed. It's this kind of benevolent individual, right? And, and that's not what this was, right? Th this was an empire that was very tenuous about to collapse regardless. And this was the leaders of that empire attempting to hold what they could together, essentially. But um, out of that discussion of Perestroika was, was the introduction of a movement called uh, Narodne Ruik, um, or the People's Movement. And I, I have here, now, I, I don't like using Wikipedia, but this is right from the website. And um, the, the website does exist. You can check it out. But I, I use this because it, it's bullet points. And so it's 
uh, it's just, I could fit it all in one slide essentially if you're watching this, but um, Northern Uruk was a boring organization, a moderate organization, uh, essentially just sought independence from Soviet Union and was a pro-democratic movement. And I, I, to, to articulate this um, possibly in a better way, I have a quote from its leader dating back to 2011. So let, let's look at this quote. We do not impose on Russia how to interpret its own history. Why did Russia try and continues to try to impose on us the use of the Russian language? Why do Russians want to make us forget our own history and our heroes? Ukrainians must know their history and live accordingly, instead of living by the stereotypes spun by czarists and Soviet ideologists. I mean, it sounds pretty reasonable to me. I would think that that's something that an anti-imperialist would support. It's that kind of language, self-determination, right, from a larger empire. And when you look at the political platform, now there, there is another section that, that has some bullets that, that highlight, but essentially it's, it's liberalism, democracy, right? Basic things like that, welfareism. Um, but the bullet points directly from this organization's website, further strengthening and developing the democratic roots of Ukrainian national statehood, implementing the ideas of democracy, pluralism, social solidarity, and an open society, rebuilding a national economy with markets, facilitating the development of entrepreneurship, um, systemic uh, agrarian reform, ensuring social security for citizens and social assistance for those in needs, pension reform, and a cultural revival of Ukrainian society, um, national identity, and Ukrainian languages, integration into the EU and NATO as a vital cornerstone of Ukraine's foreign policy. And well, you know, everything up until that last bullet point sounds extremely reasonable. When you get into NATO, you know, maybe that's a different discussion. Many people don't realize this, but Ukraine had applied to join NATO back in 2008. This is not a, a, a new thing. So uh, the idea, uh, it, of course, as we saw, goes back to World War I, right? But, and, and even earlier than that, but, um, NATO is, is, a, is a large um, target for Russian propaganda, right? So, okay, what these, so this is an independence party, it's an independence movement, it's democratic, it wants a pluralistic, open society, democracy, and uh, it essentially wants to promote Ukrainian society and language. All right, I mean, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, the way that this is portrayed in the film is that it's, it's portrayed, I, I think, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to the quote, an incubator for extremism. Now, all, none of this is talked about in the movie, right? I mean, we, we don't learn about any of this. Uh, what, what the organization is, uh, its platform, what it, it, how it exists today, its website, um, quotes from any people that were ever involved in it, interviews with anyone that was involved in it. None of that's introduced, right? And, and that's because it kind of goes against the narrative that Stone is trying to create. Instead, what Stone does is he finds some of the people that were involved in this that went on to become ultranationalists. And he talks about them, not about the other 98% of the people involved in this movement or even what this movement was, right? And there were a very small percentage of people in this that went on to become ultra-nationalist, right? But that's not what this movement was. So don't get the two conflated. And, you know, we'll talk about those people because I, I don't want to dismiss them and say it was a few bad apples because that sounds like I'm trying to excuse uh, extremists. And we're not, right? Ukraine has done bad things too. However, again, this is about the truth. So. Let's actually look at these people. Let's look at the, the, the realities of what these people meant to Ukraine. And we're going to look at voting outcomes, representation, and some statistics. Because Stone doesn't provide any of that either. All that Stone does is introduce them because they're going to be used later for a narrative in the Maidan protests. So essentially, um, Narodny Ruik, the only point of this in this film 
is a bridge to get to these extremists because he needs those characters in the movie to be involved later. Let's look at the reality of what these politicians that Stone uh, handpicked to focus on. Let, I mean, let's just put, the, we're putting this into context. What does, what does putting things in context mean? It doesn't mean dismissing them or belittling them. However, it also does not mean creating a false narrative by hyperbolically generalizing them to represent entire populations of people like Nora Neruk. So uh, that movement was not an incubation of, of radicalism. These people were involved in that because they shared common goal of an independent Ukraine. Let's look at what these people actually did in reality so that we can get an understanding of the broader context, similar, uh, similar to how we did when we were talking about OUN versus other Ukrainian nationalist organizations that far outweighed that one subsection of that group in significance and numbers. So we'll start with, with Ole here, Ole Tianbach. He was elected to, the, to Ukraine's parliament in 1998 and in 2002. He was expelled from the R Ukraine faction in 2004. Nothing that he proposed went anywhere. He, he drafted no legislation. When he, re when he ran for mayor of Kiev, he received 1.37% of the total vote. When he ran for president in 2010, he received 1.43% of the total vote. When he ran for president in 2014, <clears throat> he received 1.16% of the total vote. In 2018, he did not participate in general elections. So uh, this again is not saying ignore this. This is saying this is him in context, right? This is the, the impact. How about Dmitry Yarosh? Because this is another individual that, that Stone points out. Um, new, so again, what does the general population of Ukraine think about this guy? He received 0.7% vote in the 2014 presidential election. He was elected to a single seat of parliament with 29.76% uh, of the vote, and he lost that seat in 2019. And we might touch upon this later, but um, Stone doesn't really care about these people. He's bringing them up because this is a way for him to, to build a false narrative, a bridge um, between Ukrainian nationalist movements, uh, far right nationalists and the Maidan protests, because he's gonna say that these people also had an integral part to do with the Maidan protests. Okay, so Right Sector was a conglomeration or umbrella organization of ultra-nationalist groups. It wasn't just one, it was, it was many that, that joined forces in a united effort. Um, in total, there were somewhere between 80,000 and 120,000 people at Maidan protests at different times. Doing that math, members of the Right Sector and Svoboda combined comprised around 5% of the total people there. Now, I'm not gonna editorialize that. I'm not gonna say that means this or that. I, I'm just telling you what the actual representation of these figures and their groups are when compared, not even to the general population of Ukraine, but even to the general population of the people who are protesting at, at Maidan. And to add more context so that, you know, we also, we can see what else is going on. These are the results from parliamentary elections in Ukraine starting in 2014 and then uh, another round in 2019. In 2014, um, the People's Front uh, received 22.14% of the total vote. 
Petro Poroshenko's block received 21.82%. So those two add them up, right? That's mostly going to be the, the, the biggest portion. You have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slots down in representation to get to Svoboda. They had six seats total or 4.71% representation in parliament. And you would think that if this were some neocon backed, neo Nazi coup, that Svoboda would be running the parliament. I mean, that's the way that Oliver Stone and just all these alt imperialists and anyone who's, whose grift is to absolve other governments of, of doing bad things and they critique the, the West, right? Anyone who that's their, that's how they make their money or that's how they, they gain their, their popularity, right? They're, that's how they try to portray it. It's just copy and paste of the old Russian propaganda, which is old Soviet propaganda. But that just doesn't, it, it doesn't, the numbers don't add up. As a matter of fact, Svoboda had a much larger percentage in parliament before Maiden after 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia, which makes sense. You know, people become radicalized and they get, you know, frightened or they feel threatened. Right sector. So right sector, the conglomeration of all these different paramilitary groups. Uh, in 2014, after Maiden, they had one seat and they comprised 1.80% of the total parliament. So what's happened since 2014? Because apparently this is all, you know, going by Oliver Stone's uh, critique, things should, should really be crazy right now. So in the 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary election, SN, uh, Zelensky's party, won 43.16% of the total vote. So very much consolidation at the top. You have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots down to get to Svoboda, who won a single seat, which equaled 2.15 total representation in the parliament. And right sector did not register any seats. They're not represented in the parliament. So again, I, you know, I'm not editorializing. I'm not saying this means this or that. Uh, but I'm just giving you the statistics, right? Th this is, these are the numbers that represent the electoral significance of these figures in Ukraine. Okay, I'm gonna uh, backtrack a little bit because I, I, I want to address this um, very 1980s, I guess, style, like there's a, there's a little segue of conspiracy. It, it looks like a stone movie uh, from back in the day in, in which um, a lot of these documents are presented. Um, kind of cool graphics, you know, it, the way that it was done was okay. And, uh, but anyway, so, so the, they're presented because what it does is this, it shows that um, different intelligence organizations in the US provided aid to Ukrainian insurgents after World War II. And this is important. Now, now we, I think now we understand the idea or the framing of any Ukrainian independence movement being tied to Nazism, especially after looking at, at what we just did with the, with the more modern movement. But you know, it, we, we already talked about World War II as well, right? So, he has one more, Stone has one more task that he needs to complete. He needs to also tie support from the United States to these Ukrainian Nazis, right? Because uh, he's going to say essentially that the Maidan protest was, was a US backed neocon coup of Nazis from outer space. It, you know, it's, it, it, it kind of gets to that point, but anyway. Um, so these are real documents, right? Well, maybe these aren't, but the documents are real. I, I don't know if these are the correct images or not. And, and he shows them again um, in an attempt to connect the US to all of this, um, as that's the thrust of his conspiracy uh, theory later in the movie. He shows documents for how the CIA allowed Ukrainian insurgents that fought with Nazis to enter the US. Um, however, you know, he does it with these graphics 
And I think he's doing it to try to present this information in a way that um, to the viewer would uh, make this movie or, or make Stone look like a truth teller. Something that maybe like, you know, your government isn't telling you the truth and, and this is the, the declassified real info, right? To, because then you start, you give credence to him and you start believing him, which is the point, right? However, this isn't a conspiracy. It's just not. This is something that, I, I mean, I would like to say everybody knows about, but I mean, this is something if, if you end up in, if you take enough history classes, maybe you have to get to college, um, it, there's at least a paragraph about it, right, in a textbook. If you listen to any UFO podcast, um, they talk about this too, right? And what they talk about is probably Project Paperclip. And that is the larger um, project here. I don't recall if, if, if Stone calls that out specifically, but in general, um, you know, Project Paperclip was an actual thing. It was a thing that the, the alphabet agencies in, in the US government um, went out and they tried to get basically the best and the brightest of the Nazis um, and bring them to the US. Okay, so that's a thing, you know? And, and these people that they're talking about here, these insurgents, these aren't the best and the brightest, right? Paperclip, but this is by no means something that should be shocking. If it's shocking, I mean, I think you're kind of brainwashed about what the US government is all about. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I watch the visuals and, and they're there to, to portray a feeling or an, an, to, to, a, to emote a, a, a notion that this is like, you know, some, some deep down stuff, you know, X-Files type stuff, but it's not, we, you know, we know about this. So uh, the US and the Soviet Union both did this after the war. Um, the architect for America's aerospace program was a former Nazi, Werner von Braun. I mean, if you don't know that name, your parents probably do. Here, let's take a look. So this is the, the Hoover Digest here. Now, you know, look up Werner von Braun because, I mean, he's all over NASA, right? Everybody knew that he was a Nazi, but he was vital to the US aerospace program. He was vital to um, technology for, for rocket propulsion. He's all over paintings and, and in history, et cetera. Now, that kind of, I would think that that would kind of deflate, right? This like, this lowdown of the CIA bringing in these Ukrainian nationals. Yeah, the CIA brought in a lot of people, right? The CIA is not awesome and neither was the Soviet Union. And there was a, a version of Operation Paperclip uh, on the Soviet side as well. I do my best when it comes to pronouncing words. Um, I, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm just telling you. I, I, I do try my best, but, but let, let me give this one a shot. So here we are with Operation Asoviahim. I did my best. I think that's pretty close. Operation Asoviahim. But, you know, what was that? It, it was the, the Soviet version of, of Operation Paperclip. So what did it do? Um, I have a slide up here if you're watching the video. The U.S. sought Nazi expertise after World War II. However, the USSR did as well, and that manifested in this operation. Soviet military and special services rounded up German scientists at gunpoint. The Soviets identified roughly 2,200 Nazis that um, were, were mostly scientists that they were interested in for military development and aerospace technology. Uh, the Soviet uh, government transported between 6,000 and 7,000 Nazis um, and their families to Moscow, uh, totaling 92 trains. Um, none of this is a conspiracy. On the right-hand side, I have a series of images of houses, and, and these are like mansions, um, that were the residence of many former Nazi scientists in Russia. 
On the top, we have the residence of, of a German rocket specialist near Moscow. In the middle, um, the residence of a German rocket specialist also near Moscow. And then on the bottom, near Moscow as well, residents of the German rocket team in the village. So uh, some of these people got their own kind of mansions. Some of these people were given their own villages. But um, essentially, the idea that, first of all, it's shocking that the CIA would bring in any kind of insurgents that, that helped them. I mean, you know, whether you're, you're talking about Hmong in, in Vietnam, right, or you know, throughout history, when, that, that should be expected. And I mean, I hope that we know that alphabet agencies do bad things. I would, I would hope that. However, um, you know, maybe more to the point of the goal of this to talk about the truth and lies by omission, the Soviets did the same thing, right? They did the same stuff. Um, and if we're talking about Operation Paperclip, it was like a race to get these people. And the, if we're talking about the history of it, the, the, the story goes that the, essentially um, the you know, Red Army um, waited one night for all these scientists who were having a party to get drunk, basically. And then they walked into their, their uh, residences you know, very early in the morning with guns, and they said, come with us. And they put them into trains, and that was it. So I'm only showing this because I, I, I mean, you know, for, for me, I thought it was kind of funny, the, the whole um, showing the, the, that the CIA had, had brought in some Ukrainian nationalists, like this was some big secret or something. But, you know, also to provide context, like, yeah, we, the United States brought in a lot of people, right? The, the father of the modern uh, aerospace technology uh, in the United States was a Nazi, okay? And the Soviet Union did too. So, I mean, let's just be honest and talk about this stuff, right? It, it, it doesn't mean that it's okay, but let's be, again, let's be honest about this and have a real conversation. Uh, moving along chronologically with, with the movie, uh, Stone begins to interview Viktor Yanukovych. And you know, I put this up because Stone asks Yanukovych to talk about the Maidan protest, about the transition of power post Maidan, to talk about the association agreement, the EU trade agreements. And he obviously doesn't ask anybody else, right? He, he doesn't have, you know, a, a counterpoint to the point. And it's uh, extremely, it, it's one of those things to where when I was watching it, you know, I thought to myself, um, you know, most people watching this have to know that this is biased, right? There's no counterpoint. It's, 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 it's literally, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, and Viktor Yanukovych, right, the former president of Ukraine, who was very close to Russia. And there's no counterpoints. It, really, the, the only other, you know, primary source that's used to any extent was the chief of police during the Maidan protest. So, you know, I, I, I add this because, I mean, this is just critical thinking. And this is true for any topic. It's not just this. And if it were reversed, it would also be true. So it's not just saying that um, because, I don't know, be, because there's a false narrative being given that someone doesn't agree with, that there needs to be a counterpoint. It, it, it's, it's not that, it's just that there needs to be a counterpoint if you want to talk about the truth, right? And if people aren't interested in talking about the truth, then you have to move on and begin to consider what their intentions might be. Okay, something else that doesn't happen here. Um, the movie doesn't really talk about who Viktor Yanukovych is. It introduces him. I mean, it tells you that he was a former president of Ukraine, but he doesn't talk about, you know, his background, um, possibly, you know, why he won. Um, you know, the, the, the most that it, it, it does is that it just uh, shows the Orange Revolution and then jumps forward to victory after the, the Orange Revolution. So, um, let's talk about him, right? Because because there's no no information is given on in the film about him, and you know you probably guess there's reasons why. Okay, so background: Yanukovych is a native Russian speaker 
and he's from the Donbas region of Ukraine. Ukrainian is his second language, and uh, it's a distant second. He, he uh, in his speeches, uh, especially early on, uh, preferred Russian. Um, he did it. He did speak Ukrainian, um, obviously, because he's trying to become the, the president of that country. Um, but it, it it was very clunky, and um, I, I, I've seen references to between him and George W. Bush to where he's kind of this, you know, clunky, um, buffoonish political character. Um, one of his first priorities uh, after becoming president and he ran on this was to make the Russian language equal or nor e near equal to Ukrainian. He also uh, repeatedly blamed his loss in 2004 on US intervention. Um, it, during his, his campaigns, he discussed in, in numerous and various ways how he wanted to embrace Russia. He wanted to move closer to Russia. Um, and he wanted to essentially undo a lot of things that the orange regime um, had done before him in order to, to patch up ties with Russia. Um, it says here, the new president's inaugural Moscow visit appeared to usher in a new era between the countries. And this in, in and of itself is important because uh, Russia just stopped sending diplomats and envoys to Ukraine under the previous administration. Um, they, the previous administration having um, aspirations to potentially join NATO, to move into uh, EU agreements, uh, Russia just stopped talking to them. So the fact that there was an inaugural Moscow visit in and of itself was, was, um, was meaningful. So Yanukovych immediately extended a lease on Russia's Black Sea fleet that was stationed in Crimea. That's gonna be very important later with the annexation of Crimea. The previous administration had said that it, it wanted to terminate that lease. Um, Yanukovych stated that he would not pursue NATO membership even though, um, even though Ukraine had been in the process, not even really the mapping process, but had applied for membership in 2008. Um, it was clear that in general, right, if you step back and you look at this figure that, that you know, one, Yanukovych was, was very close to Russia in, in many ways. He spoke Russian. Um, he bumbled and stumbled when he was trying to speak Ukrainian, the language of the country that he was trying to become president of. Um, he came from a very specific region of Ukraine that wasn't representative of the rest of the country, right? He talked about undoing much of the previous administration's efforts. And in doing so, what, what did that mean? It, it meant you know, pulling back from Europe and, and the United States and moving closer to Russia. So, and, and there's a lot to this, right? But just for time, like pushing forward, I, I when he won, I, I asked myself, how, how did this guy win, right? Because it, it, you know, he's a very, a uh, specific type of, of person from Ukraine. And um, it was, you know, questionable. Like how, how did he um, appeal to this broader audience? And uh, to be honest, some of it had to do with failures of the previous administration. And I think that that's fair to say. Um, the Yoshenko regime uh, was just filled with obstacles. And, and while that's complicated, because we could talk about potentially why that occurred, uh, it did occur, right? So, so that's one, one kind of thing. But, you know, Oliver Stone likes to go down these conspiracy rabbit holes and, and you know, he even magically ties George Soros into all of this, which, you know. But um, so, so let's, let's become Oliver Stone. Let's become Stonian for a moment. And, and, and let's, let's do this ourselves because you know, Stone doesn't talk about any of this. And he put a lot of people under the microscope. Uh, he even in a roundabout way, and we'll get to it, um, claimed that the, the former president nearly poisoned himself to death in order to win, a, win the election, which is uh, just uh, astounding on multiple levels. Uh, so let's look at Viktor Yanukovych. You know, we're not gonna tear the guy apart, but let's just see what he was. 
how how did this guy again how did this guy win the general election in 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 ukraine okay so this is an ap uh news article here washington ap before signing up with donald trump former campaign manager paul manafort secretly worked for a russian billionaire with a plan to greatly benefit the putin government the associated press has learned the white house attempted to brush the report aside wednesday but it quickly raised fresh alarms in congress about Russian links to the Trump associates. Manafort proposed in a confidential strategy plan as early as June 2005 that he would influence politics, business dealings, and news coverage inside the United States, Europe, and former Soviet republics, including Ukraine, to benefit President Vladimir Putin's government, even as U.S.-Russian relations under Republican President George W. Bush grew worse. What we have here, all right, let's summarize this. Let's be Stonian. We have an American political lobbyist who has worked with Republican neocons since 1970s, having a business agreement with an oligarch at $10 million a year to pursue the interests and promote the Putin government and Moscow, not only in the United States, but also in former Soviet republics, including Ukraine. This business agreement to work on behalf of the oligarch to promote the interest of Russia in Ukraine lasted until 2009. And this agreement lasted only until 2009 because that's when this American lobbyist worked with neocons since its 70s became the campaign manager for Viktor Yanukovych. And again, to reiterate, Viktor Yanukovych and his own party, the Party of Regions, have both stated publicly that this campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was a large reason why Yanukovych was able to turn his political career around. Um, I don't know, man. I think it's I think it's weird that. Oliver Stone and you know his conspiracy stuff, he just left all this out. Um, and I think we know why. Okay, so leaving that, moving ahead, what about the trade agreement? Because you know, th this was a um, this was really the the spark, the impetus to what became with the Maiden protests. And um who describes this in, in the film? Well, of course, Yanukovych does, right? The guy who got deposed. Um, Putin does, right? the guy who didn't want Ukraine to, to sign any pro-EU trade agreements, and no one else. Because this is a biased piece of you know, political stuff that's a fictional Hollywood movie. But we'll talk about it. Let, let's get into it. What was really going on with these trade agreements that, that are lightly discussed in the film. Well, Oliver Stone would have you believe that this uh, EU trade agreement was, was in general bad. Yanukovych says that the IMF offered um, unfair proposition and that it was unwilling to negotiate. Russia stepped in and they apparently had a, a better plan. States negotiations with Europe failed. So negotiations took a pause. And we're going to uh, use that phrase, took a pause, because uh, it becomes pretty damning later. Okay. And we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this trade agreement, but there's something else aside from just the lang. Well, it's in the language, but there's something beyond economics. There's really two things beyond economics with this, right? The the first that that we have to acknowledge is that going back for 100 years prior to this, Ukraine in many different ways attempted to associate itself with Europe in order to detangle itself from whatever iteration of Russia existed at that time, the Federation, the Soviet Union, the empire. Um, so that's one thing. And that's why the Orange Revolution was so significant. It, it wasn't just an election. 
That's why the trade agreement was so significant. It wasn't just economics. It was extremely symbolic and important to the people of Ukraine. That's one thing. There's something else that, that's in this, that's, that's beyond just mere economics. Something that's really not talked about very much in the film, it's mentioned briefly. And it's this person. And so you might be saying, well, well okay, this is a trade agreement. I, and, and I don't know who this person is, maybe you do. We'll talk about her. But why, is, why are we talking about a person in a trade agreement? Well, because this isn't just economics. And there are many uh, considerations and hurdles and gates that you have to pass through in order to get to the point where the EU will even consider having some type of trade agreement with you. And, and we'll talk about those because Ukraine actually wasn't close. They, they were in a, a pre-status um, where they, they were having to meet different criteria. One of them were uh, fair courts, right? Uh, transparency and in, in legality and politics. And this was a, one of the biggest sticking points that prevented the association agreement, and we'll talk about what that means, right? That's not an EU deal per se. This is one of the biggest sticking points in the association agreement. And Yanukovych just, well, well, Stone just really didn't talk about that much. I think it was stated that, it was, that, that this was a fair trial and that was all, which is ridiculously minimizing the significance of what happened here. Let me introduce Yulia Moshenko, because Oliver Stone really doesn't. She's in it, but it, it's here and there. And you don't really get to know who this person is, much like you don't really get to know who Viktor Yanukovych is either. <clears throat> so who is Yulia? Well, she is part of the Orange Revolution that denied Yanukovych's 2004 presidency. And recall that he blamed that on the US, of course. She was Yanukovych's main opponent in 2010. Yanukovych was obsessed with jailing her. Not my words, I'll get to the quotes. She was convicted on corruption charges. During the trial, she stated that Yanukovych's regime was authoritarian, and she then went on a hunger strike. Yanukovych refused to allow Moshenko to travel abroad for medical treatment. And we'll get into some of the, the finer details of this, but long story short, Yanukovych and his unwillingness to allow Moshenko to travel abroad to receive medical care, essentially by default made any agreement with the EU dead on arrival. This was a part of the hurdles that you have to, to get through. Some of them are economic, right? Some of them are, are about corruption and transparency. Some of them are political. Some of them are with the legal system. And this was both legal and political. So this was seen as being politically motivated and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. But equally, if not more so, it was also seen as being corruption in the judiciary. And <clears throat> Yoshenko's or Yanukovych's unwillingness to allow this person to even travel abroad to get this, uh, pass this hurdle, right, to say, Look, I, at, at the very least, she's still guilty in Ukraine, but she can travel abroad in order to pass this deal, which again is far more significant than just pure economics. It's extremely symbolic, right? The fact that he just wouldn't do that because he was so hellbent on imprisoning his political opponent, going back to the Orange Revolution, um, that really nothing else mattered. And, and we'll, we'll talk about the other things because there's a lot, but this alone prevented Ukraine from moving forward with any kind of association agreement with the EU that would potentially in the future lead to some type of firm trade agreement. Her conviction led to massive protests, which aren't discussed, and clashes with police, which aren't discussed either. 
Yanukovych understood that by continuing to jail Moshenko and, and not allowing her to go elsewhere for medical care, he understood that this made any movement on the European trade agreement de facto dead. And so you have to ask yourself, one, was this strategic? Because he didn't really want to be in a position to sign it in the first place. Um, two, did he actually believe that Yulia was, was guilty of these, these crimes? And we'll kind of talk about it briefly, but... Um, or three, did, did he really think that as president of Ukraine that he had full control over these internal matters of Ukraine and that it wasn't up to the EU to interfere on internal matters, even if they do involve legal corruption and uh, political revenge calculations? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, and of course, we can't know the answer to that. But it, it seems very clear, and again, we'll get to quotes, et cetera, that he was hell-bent on getting this woman in jail and that he was not going to release her, whether or not that meant he was going to trade, uh, sign any type of trade agreement with the, the EU or, or not. Some other things about Yulia. Uh, she herself was Jewish. So she was not a Nazi. She was a pro-European populist who adopted a traditional Ukrainian hairstyle to represent love of her country, right? Her, her nationality. You can see that here. So she's not an extremist. She's not a Nazi. In fact, she's part Jewish, right? So what happened? How did she end up in jail? Back in 1995, Moshenko became the president of United Energy Systems of Ukraine. The company imported gas from Russia, which could be re-exported to the West or sold internally. She was first elected to the Ukrainian parliament back in the mid-90s, and in 1999 was appointed deputy prime minister for fuel and energy. She was jailed under the Yanukovych regime, which we talked about, something she and nearly every outside country except Russia saw as being politically motivated. The official charge was a vague abuse of office for her time as prime minister. Moshenko was then leader of the main opposition party to Yanukovych. And ironically, Yanukovych's own business conglomerate called The Family, and no, I'm not making that up, was investigated by Ukraine's Secret Service which ended up accusing his associates of various crimes connected to energy trading, including price gouging of state controlled entities, fictitious supply deals to state firms, and the embezzlement of state funds. So, why am I talking about that? Well, because really, Yulia was arrested under corruption charges. Um, and how could we put this mildly? There's a lot of corruption going on in Ukraine, right? Uh, it's it, it it's a problem, right? Ukraine's not perfect. Um, so, after kind of throwing things against the wall, Yanukovych was able to to bring Yulia, his main opposition, up on charges of corruption and and get her in jail for that. And you know, the, everybody except Russia looked at this and scoffed, not because they were saying she's you know, probably 100% innocent, but because they said, I mean, this is selective justice, right? You're all corrupt, right? You could be put in jail as well. And uh, to outline some of the validity be behind that, that type of realistic view of the, of the world, including Ukraine, was the family, right? Yanukovych's own business conglomerate, which, I mean, it just doesn't get any more HBO mob than the family embezzling state funds connected to energy trading with Russia, that does it. But you know, I'm, I'm showing you this um, because it, it's also going to play into some things with Yanukovych later too, with the um, trade agreement. Um, part of some of the, um, 
the obstacles, right, or, or goals or benchmarks, what have you, that Ukraine would have to meet in order to move forward with the, um, any type of trade agreement would be for transparency in economics and transportation. And, well, you know, transparency in economics and transportation of, of goods and services in the country probably wouldn't have done well with the family who, after Yanukovych was out of office, was investigated by Ukrainian security services for a whole host of illegal activity. So again, along with preconditions of freeing his political opponent, uh, which was seen largely as selective justice and political revenge, more stringent transparency laws regarding business and transport would have directly impacted the family of which Yanukovych was essentially the, the conglomerate head of. And so here, uh, this is an article, uh, it's, it's an extended article, a number of uh, individual articles, kind of about the history of, of corruption in modern Ukraine, not only with um, Yanukovych, also um, Yoshenko and, and other people too. There's this paragraph that's, um, that's in between uh, the European Court for Human Rights ruling that um, Moshenko's arrest and conviction was arbitrary uh, and unlawful justice above and then below the family talking about how Yanukovych um, had consolidated various business interests under this umbrella that was uh, later investigated by Ukrainian special services. In between these two paragraphs is this, and it's a quote from a former party member of the Party of Regions, which once again, remember, the Party of Regions is um, Yanukovych's own political party. So a former member of the Party of Regions who served as Ukraine's general prosecutor remembers that Yanukovych was obsessed with putting Moshenko away. This is that quote that I, I was uh, talking about. Quote, he had one problem, how to jail Moshenko. She ended up not being released from prison until after the Euromaidan revolution ousted Yanukovych in 2014. So a member of his own political party is on the record stating that, yeah, Yanukovych essentially had one problem, in quotes, how to jail his political opponent, which she was a part of the Orange Revolution, which he blamed on the United States as well, which was the first time they ran for president and he lost. And she was his main political opponent currently. It's weird, you know, Oliver Stone doesn't mention any of this stuff, does he, right? Did, you know, we, we'll get into it, but you end up in these alt imperialist discussions to where they'll say things like, you know, oh, a court of human rights, that's, that's Western imperialism. And it just makes you just shake your head, right? Um, but, but reining this back in, right? Reining this back in, okay, so Yanukovych is corrupt, right? Yanukovych is, is jailing political opponents. Um, there's a lot of, of narratives that we could tell about how that could impact um, any type of movement with the, with the, the trade association agreement with the EU, but the, the jailing in and of itself kills any prospect of that alone. And that's not like a narrative. That's not saying, well, you know, Yanukovych had this, this you know, shady organization called the family. And perhaps if by signing this agreement, there would be more transparency, some of his illegal dealings and corruption would be brought to light. You know, that we're, we're stretching a little bit, even though there was an investigation later. Um, you know, if we're, if we're going to say Moshenko was, was targeted um, because this was, you know, everybody was corrupt, you know, we, we kind of can't say the same about Yanukovych and say, oh, he's corrupt and finger wag, everybody's corrupt, right? Um, but we have to know this for context. What we can say is that no matter what Yanukovych says about how he wanted to do this or do that, or how he, you know, he was trying so hard with the IMF and they, they just weren't budging. None of that mattered. None of that mattered as long as he had Moshenko in jail, right? And to be honest, those, those European organizations, that, I mean, they were, they were even saying, just get her out of the country, right, for, for medical. And I think everybody understands that the implication of that is that she probably wouldn't be returning to the country. 
But in a way, it's exiling her, and it gave Yanukovych an out to where he could look like someone who's not completely corrupt, right? And and also remove this obstacle towards going forward with the trade agreement, if, if you follow me. Essentially, Europe was trying to give him an out, right? By saying, okay, look, we all know that if she gets out of the country for medical help, she's, she's not going back, right? However, this is a de facto exile. And so she's out of your way, right? You want her out of the way, she's out of the way. She's in France now, right? She's hanging out in Paris talking about stuff. She's not running against you, organizing against you in Ukraine, which is what you want anyway. So just get her out of the country. And then once we do that, then we can say that you met this benchmark goal and can move forward with an association agreement. But Yanukovych wouldn't even do that. And so that's why you have to really think about how, how serious was he about ever signing any agreement with Europe, even though he campaigned. Remember who his campaign manager was, even though he campaigned on, on saying that, that he would make best efforts to do so. Okay, now let's talk about what this agreement was because the movie really doesn't clarify what they're talking about, what, what Putin and, and Yanukovych are talking about, no one else about what this agreement is. So the concept reaches as far back as 2005. That's five years before Yanukovych was even president, right? So this wasn't some new thing that had all these sticking points that had to be ironed out. This had been, the wheels had been moving on this for years before Yanukovych was even in office, right? And it, this agreement was an association style agreement, right? The association style agreement was proposed in 2008, still a few years before Yanukovych was in office. Um, an association agreement is not a trade agreement, right? An association agreement is essentially if you do certain things, like don't put away your political opponents for arbitrary um, or cherry picked, you know, <laughs> uh, violations of the law, of which you yourself and your organizations are you know, involved with as well. If you, don't, if you don't do things like that, if you have a free, open democratic society, your legal system is as above the board as you know, maybe the US, which is a low bar, um, then we'll talk about what type of agreements we can do. And basically we can try it out, right? It's, it's, going on, it's going on a date with someone and getting coffee in the daytime at, you know, for lunch or something. You're, you're, you're feeling the waters out. So after an associate, well, first of all, you have to meet the preconditions for an association agreement. And that's where Ukraine was, right? They weren't even there yet. So they were still meeting these, these preconditions. Once you meet the preconditions for an association style agreement, then you enter into the association style agreement, perhaps in the future, then you can talk about EU membership. So that's how far away Ukraine is now, even after they sign the association style agreement, from entering into some type of like full EU uh, membership. Um, and, and this is important because again, none, they don't, None of this is talked about in the film. It's very frustrating. It's just shown as they use the acronyms because you know, that would make anyone, on, especially on the left, their ears perk up, and those on the far right who have these, you know, world, one world order, new world order, whatever conspiracies. You know, it, so you want to talk about the IMF, right? But th that's not even really. They 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 weren't there yet. They were still in this association style agreement. Now, now were some of these organizations, you know, involved at this point? Yes, because they were talking about financing. So that's fair, right? We, we have to say that. But it wasn't as if financing from the IMF was going to undo an EU membership, right? That's what I'm trying to say, is that even these things that Yanukovych is talking about, and, and let's just give him the benefit, right? Oliver Stone doesn't give anyone the benefit, but we'll do that. Well, let's give Yanukovych a benefit. Maybe there were some unfair, uh, uh, what he saw as being un unfair things with a, a loan or something to gain financing. Okay, all right. Still, that is not the stumbling block to an EU membership, right? 
we're still trying to get to an association agreement. And, you knew, and Yanukovych has his main political opponent in jail and won't release her, even though Europe is kind of like giving him an out to do so. That's, that's where we're really at in, in this broader story. So uh, on July 22nd in 2008, it was announced that a stabilization and association type agreement would be signed between Ukraine and the European Union in talks with countries that have expressed a wish to join the European Union, the EU typically concludes uh, association agreements in exchange for commitments to political, economic, trade, or human rights reform in that country. And so that's where that that's where you, the Yanukovych regime was. Even though that this whole process had, had been going on for a number of years, that's where they were in the timeline of, of events. So in, in, in other words, to move forward, EU officials wanted evidence of future parliamentary and presidential elections that were free, uh, fair and free, uh, some type of measurable decrease in corruption and evidence of advances in human rights, including judicial reform. There is also something else that was uh, important too, and we'll look at it. It was a key piece that involved gas laws. So what, what are these gas laws? Well, it's the, the European Union Energy Acquiesce, and that was part of this association agreement. It involved five waves of protocols to meet prior to consideration for an association agreement. Um, so, so this is not the human rights stuff. This is not the free and fair elections. This has to do with energy. Um, so the scope of the EU energy acquiesce to be implemented and applied by Eastern neighboring countries. The protocols on ascension impose legally binding obligations on Moldova and Ukraine to implement specific scope of EU energy acquiesce. Um, four waves for Moldova, five for Ukraine. Further, Ukraine undertook legal commitments to abide to the principles of EU competition, to follow generally applicable standards of European community on operating energy network systems and to adopt security of supply statements, among other things. But the, the key to this is going to be to abide to principles of EU competition. And we'll, we'll get to why that's important in a moment because it was another key stumbling block to any movement with, with an association agreement. In 2011, Putin visited Ukraine directly after Yanukovych had stated that he hoped Ukraine would sign an association agreement with the European Union before the end of the year. On the other, he backed a special relationship with the Moscow-led single economic space, a deepening of customs union that includes Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. So this is a, a customs union that Russia is proposing and that Putin is, is trying to convince Yanukovych to join. It offered many short-term benefits. And this is something that you might see people um, fire back on if you say that uh, the trade agreement with the EU would have been better for Ukraine. Um, and, and the people say, no, the Russian was actually better. And in, in the short-term uh, benefits that the, the Russian customs agreement was benefit was more beneficial. They included a lot of, of perks, including cheaper uh, cheaper gas, um, reconciliation of, of, of prior energy debts, uh, et cetera. So Russia was throwing everything at Ukraine to get them into this customs union. And that sounds good, right? That sounds good, but why was that? Why is that a problem then, right? Well, for a few reasons. The first one, entering into such a customs union would negate necessary steps in the association agreement that energy acquiesce about competition. And Russia knows this. So pressuring Ukraine to join a customs agreement is a de facto geopolitical win for Russia because it negates any movement on a trade association agreement with Ukraine and the EU. Entering into a customs union is contrary to and conflicts with part of that energy acquiesce, which 
that Ukraine needed to meet to even enter into an association agreement. Forget about EU membership, right? This was one of the preconditions. And Russia really started pushing this right at the time when Yanukovych was saying, well, maybe we'll join the EU, right? At the time, Moscow upped the ante by making Ukraine an offer that was very difficult to refuse. Russia offered $8 billion in annual natural gas subsidies if Ukraine passed on its talks with the EU and joined this custom union instead. So the first, the first issue with this, right, is that, again, you can't do both. Entering into a special customs agreement with a country conflicts with the free and fair competition energy acquiesce that you need to pass in order to move forward with the EU trade agreement. So this is really one or the other. Yanukovych oftentimes in, in the movie attempts to say, I was trying to do both. Well, either you're extremely naive or what you're doing is just kind of pushing the EU thing along so that people don't, I don't know, protest outside of, uh, of the parliamentary building or, or, or go into a square and, and set up camp for a few months, right? So, you know, there, there's that. Then there's also this broader concept, right? Of the trade, any trade agreement with Europe, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's for, you know, match sticks that, that involve $10 a year revenue. It's, it's the symbolic movement of Ukraine away from Russia that is equally as significant to Ukrainian nationalists, people in Ukraine that love their country, as the fine details. So looking at, you know, what, what would this, it, what would this uh, appear, right? It, it would be as if an unfriendly country or, or a former colonizing power was, was trying to give a country a trade agreement and threw everything against the wall at them saying, we'll do all this great stuff. We're gonna give you all this, this, this money. We're gonna give you all these discounts on, on energy. The, the people there are still going to say, yeah, but we have been trying to get away from you for over a hundred years, right? And this agreement with Europe symbolically did so, right? So there's that. But then there's also a, a less emotional and more practical side to this as well. Once Ukraine joined any type of this customs, you know, this, this, this customs union, right? At that point, it would no longer be able to move forward with any type of EU association agreement. And that means that it would be solely involved with who? With Kazakhstan? No. With, Mount, with, with Russia. And just as Russia can offer $8 billion a year, Russia can also retract that offer of $8 billion a year. And you have to use your common sense. This traps Ukraine. This makes Ukraine reliant on Russia economically. Administratively, this is reincorporating the most important aspects of the U Ukrainian economy back into, well, something like a former Soviet relationship to which Ukraine is independent, has its own elections. However, it's extremely tied to the Federation, at that time, the Soviet Union, and that it's not able to make any independent, sovereign economic decisions on its own. Because if it did, if, 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 if Yanukovych went into this customs union and then a year later said, well, I'm gonna to talk to the EU, guess what Putin can do, or, or just whomever in Moscow, all those nice things that they offered them are just gonna go away. Right, and any politician is going to understand that. That's not going to get them reelected. 
right? That's going to throw them out of office. So there's a lot going on here. One, there's this idea of, of this trade agreement being, or this customs union being great. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's great because it's a hard sell because it, it just de facto kills any association agreement with Europe, right? Two, there's this idea that the association agreement could have been worse. It doesn't even matter. It's the fact that you're moving away from that, that Ukraine, and not only that Ukraine is moving away from Russia, that Ukraine is becoming sovereign and independent in its decisions, not a mere reflection of Moscow like Alexander Dugan states. Even if it's a bad decision, it's their decision, right? There's that. But then there's also this. To believe that Russia was actually interested in a customs agreement all of a sudden, a customs union, and that they were really going to offer Ukraine for the foreseeable future, all this great stuff, all these great subsidies, and et cetera, et cetera. One has to be extremely naive. Really what this was about was putting Yanukovych in a public perception situation to where it looked as if he didn't engage with the customs union, he was actually hurting Ukraine. And by doing so, negating any movement on the association agreement or just de facto killing it. I mean, this, the, the customs union, along with the imprisonment of Moshenko, made any progress with the EU um, impossible. And these are decisions that Yanukovych made. These aren't, this isn't the United States. This isn't George Soros, right? This isn't anything like that. These are political decisions that Yanukovych is making. And either he's extremely dumb and doesn't understand the consequences, but I don't think that. I think he understood the consequences and that he just didn't want to sign the association agreement. And so that these were things that he could do and then try to flip it and say, well, I tried, you know, I kept talking. Well, yeah, you kept talking, but it's because the decisions that you made <laughs> made it impossible for anything to happen, right? So Yanukovych never had to say, I'm not signing the agreement. We're not doing it, right? He never had to say that because his actions said that for him. And I mean, you know, th that it makes sense to me. But just so you understand, like I, so I thought of that, that, that was my original, you know, I'm looking at this with a skeptical eye, like, yeah, right. Like these, you know, this is a joke, but uh, I, I did search for it. Take the source for what you, what you will. It's the source that would be talking about something like this, but Timothy Ash, an analyst with the Royal Bank of Scotland told the Kiev Post, quote, this is a serious offer from the Russians who seem desperate to lock Ukraine in and make sure it does not sign the free trade agreement with the EU. So, you know, it, it wasn't as if people didn't understand what this customs union was all about, right? Everybody knew that the only reason why it came about was to get Ukraine and, and, and other countries in the area away from the European Union, because again, part of even getting to an association agreement, which is just talking about trading with each other, there are things that you have to do. One of them is the energy acquiesce, which is a non-competition market, a free trade market. Well, a customs union is the opposite of that. Just one more thing on this before we move forward. This also directly plays into this Eurasianist, Russian imperial view. If you go back and you, and you, if you think about the things that we talked about with Alexander Dugin, um, if, when we looked at his books and you know some of the quotes about Ukraine and how Ukraine is a problem, right? A sovereign Ukraine with territorial ambitions is a problem for Eurasia that must be solved. This is what that looks like in policy, right? This is Russia looking at Ukraine, which is vitally important to the, the Eurasian imperialistic project, and saying, don't go with the EU, we'll give you all this great stuff if you join us. Once they join, they are no longer capable of negotiating with the EU, right? It goes against some of the primary things that you have to meet before the EU will even talk to you about agreements. 
So you're locked in with Russia. And if you start doing anything that Russia doesn't like, if you elect somebody that Russia doesn't like, then Russia can say, okay, those things are no longer in practice. That $8 billion, we're gonna reduce it to four. This pipeline that we were going to build uh, through Ukraine to transfer uh, gas to Central Europe that Ukraine would you know, gain many benefits from, whether it's trade or employment, we're, we're gonna build that around Ukraine this time because you elected someone who's pro-EU. I mean, this is, you know, you have to get real with this stuff. And <laughs> that's what this is about. This is about Russia controlling Ukraine. And this is not only ideological, not only philosophical in, in reading these 900 page books, this is what that type of abstract ideology looks like in political practice. This is an article from the Kiev Post. It's an interview with a politician who was in the majority party prior to Yanukovych. And the Kiev Post asks him, if the current government is so pro-Russian, as many experts believe, why are there attempts to negotiate down the price of Russian natural gas imports taking so long and so far proving unsuccessful? And the response, Russia is acting in a rather unfriendly way towards the current Ukrainian government when it constructs the so-called North Stream pipeline and continues talking about construction of the South Stream pipeline, both bypassing Ukraine's Europe-bound gas transportation system. Those projects will obviously cause harm to both Ukraine and the European Union, as they will plunge Europe into more gas dependence on Russia. Meanwhile, Russian big business is eager to snap up its slice of attractive parts of Ukraine's economy, just like our domestic big business groups. The authorities should realize this. The Kiev Post asks, maybe they do realize it. Recently in Davos, Yanukovych called Russia's South Stream not a commercial project, but a way to pressure Ukraine. Does this mean that Yanukovych and his team are starting to move away from Russia? The response. I suppose our ruling team, so Yanukovych, merged with Russia so closely that it is now finding it very difficult to drift apart from it. Realism is catching up to the Ukraine-Russia relations. Alas, Ukraine's authorities are starting to realize that Russia will not be satisfied as long as an independent Ukrainian state exists. The mere existence of Ukraine as a state is a challenge for the Russian political elite. And the more Ukrainian authorities protect the country's national interests, the worse relations between Ukraine and Russia will get. And I think that in those two paragraphs, much of what I've tried to say up to this point regarding everything from uh, you know, Vladimir Putin to Alexander Dugin to uh, extremists in Donbass to um, political theory, all of these things uh, going up to the idea of an association agreement versus a customs union and what that means not economically, but symbolically, and, and also practically in the long-term perspective of things. I think these two paragraphs summarize this pretty well. And um, it's, I find it, int I find it, um, it's, a, it's a fresh of breath air to hear a politician speak so honestly, to be, <laughs> for me to be completely honest. I mean, he says two things, he, he, he says one, you know, look, Russia is trying to pressure Ukraine to join this customs union. And one of the things that they're doing is talking about construction of pipelines that bypass Ukraine. You know, that, I mean, I, that, that's a practical um, reality, right? So trying to, to, to force Ukraine or put pressure on Ukraine to join this customs union, along with all these great, nice things that they're including in it, um, 
maybe equally, if not more so, to de facto kill any association agreement. And why? Because this isn't about economics. This isn't about a customs association with, with Kazakhstan and Ukraine and Russia. It's because this is ideological, right? This is territorial. And this is what Ukrainian, and this is back in 2011, right? This is before everything kind of blew up. And, and so this is what we've been trying to show in the video that is completely left out of, um, of the Stone movie. The person speaking here, this, this type of discussion, right? I mean, this is realism, right? This is realism. These people aren't, this, this person's not a Nazi, right? This person's not part of right sector. This person's not, and this is a person just speaking honestly. And look it, it's not to say that Russia is evil, right? The US would do the same thing. That's fine. But if you're gonna say that the US does all this bad stuff, I mean, you have to also say that Russia is too. And you have to say that Ukraine is caught in the middle. And the only difference between these two powers is that Ukraine has been trying to get away from Russia forever. And so it chooses Central Europe, or it's, it's trying to, right? I, I, I feel like that's a pretty honest assessment. You know, now, now there's more to it. However, even in the areas where there's more to it, Crimea and Donbass, there's also a very sketched history with those too. And, and we've talked about that a little bit. We'll talk about the Crimean referendum in a moment though. Here, there's a, a poll conducted in October um, by GFK Ukraine, and this is 2013. So this is you know leading up leading up to when when everything goes uh, crazy. But so a poll conducted October two uh, through 15 showed three times as many Ukrainians favoring the association agreement with Europe with the European Union as supporting the Russian-led customs union. And uh, if you're listening to this audio, there is a, uh, there's a, a bar graph here and it shows almost 40% saying sign an association agreement with the EU and in the future become an EU member. Now those are two different things, right? But still that's almost 40%. And then there's about 6% that says sign the association agreement but do not become an EU member. So that puts it over 40%, right? closer to 45 percent there is less than 15 percent who says become a member of the customs union so 40 plus to 15 percent there are more people at fit at closer to actual 15 percent the customs union is about 14 or 13 percent the 15 percent is people saying don't join any kind of union <laughs> right so more people are saying don't do anything then people are saying become a member of this Russian proposed customs union. And that leads us to the Maidan protests. And there are a lot of topics within the Maidan protests. It's not just the actual protests themselves. As a matter of fact, in this um, slide here is this still frame from the 30 minute mark. We can see the caption. There was a big number of NGOs financed from abroad. So we're, we're gonna jump into all of these subsections now. Uh, so NGOs are, this is a, a complicated topic. It's, it's something that really deserves a separate podcast. And so I'm not going to delve too far into it, but uh, you should know that a number of years ago, back in 2012, I believe, there was a creation of something called the Russian Foreign Agent Law that forced any non-governmental organizations operating in Russia to go through a series of um, benchmarks, I suppose that you could say. You had to register um, the organization and yourself as a foreign agent. And uh, I, this is just Wikipedia because I don't want to uh, get too sidetracked, but I did want to show this to you because this idea of NGOs being um, 
what what could the term be uh, it, it, being used by foreign governments um, and or being used to subvert um, authority uh, is not it, it's not new and it's not something Oliver Stone came up with and it I, I'm I'm operating from memory a bit but I do I I recall that during this time there was a big uh, there was a push um, in the international community to discuss LGBTQ rights in Russia. And there were some laws that were passed that um, essentially combined or, or, or it, at least in the verbiage combined LGBTQ members with pedophilia. And that these shortly thereafter, this Russian foreign agents law came to be um, that essentially, again, if you're operating as a within an NGO, you had to register with the government, um, and there are articles in the period uh, that discuss what that was like. And and so, for instance, you might have somebody that follows, you know, like a like a government representative that would, um, you know, follow you or be your guide and and things like that, but very controlling, and um, not to say that. There have been no NGOs that have been used by government agencies. Um, that's that's not accurate either. But we're talking about Russia specifically, and so I, I did want to bring this up. That this has been a long-standing idea, right, about Westernism, right, creeping in to to Russia via NGOs. The foreign agents law having been at least noted, let's move on and talk about some of the NGOs that Oliver Stone left out of the movie. Because again, we're not saying that there aren't NGOs. We're not saying that the alphabet agencies in the US has never used them for uh, scandalous things. But what we are saying is that the way in which Oliver Stone presents uh, things that occurred in Ukraine involving NGOs is not entirely accurate because he's only telling you part of the story. So. Let's talk about the other part of the story. And we're looking at one right here, if you're watching the video, um, a very influential NGO is Ukrainian Choice. And this was one of their billboards and they had billboards set up all throughout Ukraine. Um, and th this we can see, now it's it's not in English, but long story short, what this billboard is, is showing are uh, two men holding a heart, two women holding a heart and two men holding a heart. And so basically what the NGO is promoting is this idea that you know, interaction with Europe or Westernism in general uh, promotes, I guess, it, it makes you gay, I suppose. And it's, it, it's silly, but that's you know, the long and, and the short of this propaganda poster. But let, let, let's look at um, Ukrainian choice here. So along with interacting with Europe and that legalizing same-sex marriage and therefore making you gay, there are some other things that Ukrainian uh, choice in, engaged with. And of course, Oliver Stone tells you none of this, right? It was founded in 2012, so right at the time in which the Yanukovych uh, uh, regime was uh, at boiling point, right, in terms of the association agreement. It's a uh, pro-Russian, anti-European Union, anti-NATO, basically anti-West, right? The purpose of it was many things, but really aimed at changing public perception towards the EU association agreement. And we saw that it was actually popular and was far more popular than the customs union. But the, the purpose of this was to sway public perception away from um, EU association agreements. Um, it proposed instead a decentralized federation uh, in which Ukraine would maintain territorial integrity, but um, become part of a federation with Russia, which is, <laughs> you know, we just kind of talked about this, that, that, that customs union kind of does this by default. And this is exactly what Alexander Dugan said in his book where he said, you know, Ukraine with territorial ambitions and independence is a problem for Eurasia. Um, so again, this is all kind of coming together, right? It's this idea that um, Russia is essentially seeking to 
have um, Kiev be a, a, a mirror, right, a projection um, from Moscow. So independent kind of in name only. And the uh, person that organized all this is uh, Viktor Medvedchuk. And uh, so he is, he's a Putin ally. And, you know, people say that, but it, it's to the point to where Putin is a godfather of his child. So this is not a conspiracy. This is much more grounded in reality than many of the conspiracies Oliver Stone uh, presents, actually. But, but let, let's continue with this non-governmental organization working on behalf of the Russian government against the association agreement, pro-Russian, anti-NATO, anti-EU, that Oliver Stone just leaves out. Right. And we again, you know, we know why he left it out. So here's an example of the NGOs work. We already saw that one um, billboard that was up claiming that if Ukraine worked with with Europe, that same sex marriage would be legalized. And I guess I don't know. People are bigoted. I, I don't. But anyway, uh, he, here's another example. And so here you have Viktor uh, Yanukovych. Uh, standing amongst a group of Jewish people. And uh, on the bottom here, so, so the center image, if you're watching, is, is the, um, the article, right, that was put up by Ukrainian Choice, this NGO, Russian-backed. If you scroll down, it says, the Ukrainian Choice insulted uh, Jews of Ukraine. Um, it says that the website of the public movement Ukrainian choice of Viktor Medvedchuk published an openly vile insulting article on Jews. And the title of it is Jews, Jews, there are only Jews around. Um, we'll scroll down a little bit more so we can, we can see what the actual article is. But this is, you know, we talked about this already with uh, the current president Zelensky and how Russian extremists in Donbass were um, uh, disseminating anti-Semitic literature uh, of course, because Zelensky is is Jewish, um, and we saw that that one image with the the Israeli flag directly above him, and then above that the U.S. and NATO, kind of like all combining into this anti-Semitic um, trope, showing that uh, you know there are these Jewish puppet masters behind the scenes. I mean, it's 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 one of the oldest conspiracies in the world. Well, here's a here's this Russian NGO owned by. Um, a man who's, who's, whose child uh, is, is, you know, Vladimir Putin is, is the godfather to his child, operating in 2012 at the height of association agreement, um, you know, negotiations shortly before the Maidan protests and Viktor Yanukovych being deposed. Uh, lots of money being funneled into this. Oliver Stone leaves it out. And, and you know, for all of the talk of, of Nazis, right? You can't be, it's impossible to be a Ukrainian nationalist without being a Nazi, according to this movie. Um, you know, here we go. Here is a, a, a pro-Russian NGO, right? And this is the conspiracy that, that Maiden only happened or, or changed people's opinions because of trickery on social media and, and Western non-governmental organizations. And it just, Get, it goes out into uh, crazy land for a second with color revolutions. Well, okay, you know, here we are uh, with not, not only um, a, a homophobic uh, billboard, but also an, an anti-Semitic one, which is just ironic given the, the narrative of which this, uh, this movie is trying to create. And here we have another article about Ukrainian choice. Uh, SBU, which is Ukrainian Special Services, basically, came up with uh, searches in the office of the public movement uh, that uh, this is translated, so it's a little bit off, but it says SBU came with searches in the office of the public movement Medvedchuk. So here, let's go down and it'll, it'll describe it more. The security services of Ukraine conduct searches in the offices of the all Ukrainian public movement Ukrainian Choice. So this is, they basically raided uh, offices of Ukrainian choice. What did they find? Investigative actions are taking place in Kiev. According to law enforcement sources, during the occupation of Crimea, the central office uh, of, so the central office of Ukrainian choice coordinated the actions of the Crimean cells, whose representatives actively promoted the entry 
of the peninsula into the Russian Federation. Subsequently, they participated in the organization and holding of illegal referendums and elections to the so-called legislative body of the Republic of Crimea, the State Duma of the Russian Federation and the president. There are also reasons to believe that leadership of the Ukrainian choice, which is located in Kiev, continues to coordinate the activities of its members with the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, despite attempts to publicly disassociate themselves from their illegal actions of their colleagues on the peninsula. Uh, it, it, it goes on, but in the interest of time, again, what this is saying is that this NGO um, promoted uh, these referendums, uh, but, but did more than that, actually engaged in them and, and basically worked with, they were the people on the ground that, that helped you know, make these things happen. They were like the volunteers and stuff. So uh, it, not only did this NGO promote all these things, like Oliver Stone tries to say, you know, apparently it's gonna brainwash you and you don't have any independent thought. So it did that talking about, you know, the Alexander Dugan type of Eurasian federalism versus, you know, legalizing gay marriage. And, and having Jewish people control Ukraine, which is what would happen if you entered into negotiations with Europe, apparently. Uh, even more than just that kind of vile rhetoric are actual uh, boots on the ground, things happening. I can only imagine what, what Oliver Stone would have done if one of the non-governmental organizations that he picked out uh, were, were, were doing something like co collecting um, votes in, in Maiden, you know, or or going around with clipboards for, for referendums and, and things of, of, of that nature. Uh, th this is a rabbit hole. And, and so check out Ukrainian Choice if you're interested, because there's much more to it than just this. They get directly involved in, in some actions with Russia. OK, so what other, what other NGOs are happening? Because Oliver Stone rattles off a few. So, so what, what maybe, what, what are a, a few that, that he didn't include instead of just maybe one that's particularly bad. Russian world, this one's really interesting because I think that this one um, could be the stuff of conspiracy for sure. Um, this fund was established by a decree of President Putin and is essentially a structural unit of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. Such organizations in Ukraine include the Association of Compatriots Peace Initiative Development, NGO Russian School, Russian National Community, Ruzik Slavic Values, Academy, and dozens of others. And I think that this one is particularly interesting because it can present itself um, as something as basic as a Russian language school. Uh, however, when you look at the funding, it, it does go back to the Russian government. Um, so I, I can, you know, I mean, this, I, this is something if you, if you took Russia out and you put the US here, I mean, this is something that, you know, alt imperialist or, or right wing conspiracy people would, would have a field day with. But it, it, it's something, again, that's, that was left out of this movie because it goes against the false narrative that, that's being presented. This is another example of a NGO working within Ukraine. This one is specific to Crimea. It's called the Russian Community of Crimea. And I have an example of um, one of its articles, right? Some of the propaganda that, that's put out in Ukraine. And after translation, it says, the Russian Community of Crimea, neo-Nazis and the armed forces of Ukraine are carrying out a Holocaust of Russians in the Donbass. And you know, that's interesting because that's the same thing that you will hear alt imperialists and sometimes just misguided leftists uh, online say. Um, and this is of course, just Russian propaganda. And now this is interesting because this particular Russian NGO is headed by a Ukrainian politician. Uh, Sergei Teskov was previously a member of Yanukovych's uh, political party, the Party of Regions but is now a member of United Russia, whose de facto leader is Vladimir Putin. So he was in uh, the Party of Regions and then after, after uh, the annexation, went ahead and joined United Russia. Um, so, I mean, I could only, again, I, I could only imagine what, what Oliver Stone would, would do with this 
Um, you have a, a an elected official who is so pro-Russian, he, he's wearing the Russian flag, um, who switched to a Russian party, which is the de facto leader of Vladimir Putin, after being annexed, publishing articles talking about how um, Russians in Donbass are, are being attacked by neo-Nazis and the armed forces of Ukraine in a Holocaust, which is, you know, it, it, yeah, there, there, there's bad, there are bad things happening there. And some of the people who are doing those bad things uh, do have extremist beliefs. But it, it, the, the, the term Holocaust, I think, is used specifically for two reasons. One, because, of course, it, it brings you back to World War II, and, and that's what, that's the primary goal for uh, Moscow and this propaganda. But number two, uh, don't forget about the Ukrainian famine as well. Right. And that that fine line uh, that, that, you know, what was that an accident due to an extremely increased industrialization over a short period of time? Or was that targeted because Ukraine had sought independence directly prior to the Soviet Union reabsorbing it into the Soviet Union? Here's a chart a table, um, key state foundations. So these are, you know, Russia does things a little bit differently, but these are basically NGOs with direct ties to the government. And uh, I'm not gonna try to pronunciate all these cause I'll, I'll mess them up, but some of them, um, Foundation for Support of Compatriots, Moscow House of Compatriots, Intergovernmental Foundation for Humanitarian Cooperation of CIS countries, uh, Russian World Foundation. There's some other ones I'm not going to play with because I'll probably say them wrong. Um, and this is only one table. So, so there are many others. I guess the, the point in, in showing this is that if we're going to believe that, that NGOs are a de facto arm of the U.S. government um, serving uh, a, a dual purpose in foreign countries to promote U.S. interests, well, I mean, Russia just skips that nuance. The, these, these foundations are just openly, directly getting money from the Russian government, and, and they're doing the same thing. Uh, again, Oliver Stone doesn't talk about any of this because he's lying to you. If you're interested in, in learning more, because again, we need to keep this uh, video moving, I found a research paper um, title, Agents of the Russian World, Proxy Groups in the Contested Neighborhood, Agents, uh, or excuse me, Russia and their Eurasia Program from April 2016. And um, it, it, it's, it lays out some, some pretty good information about how Russia utilizes these, these governmental front groups. For now, I, I'm bringing up the, the summary page. There's a, a, a few paragraphs here. Anxious about losing ground to Western influence in the post-Soviet space and the ousting of many pro-Russian elites by popular electoral uprisings, the Kremlin has developed a wide range of proxy groups in support of its foreign policy objectives. The network of pro-Kremlin groups promotes the Russian world, which we talked about, a flexible tool that justifies increasing Russian actions in the post-Soviet space and beyond, uh, Eurasia. Russian groups are particularly active in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Um, Georgia was mentioned by, by Stone, too. Countries have declared their intention to integrate with the West. And I think that this is probably the most important here. Russia employs a vocabulary of soft power to disguise its soft coercion efforts aimed at retaining regional supremacy. Russian pseudo-NGOs undermine the social cohesion of neighborhood states through the consolidation of pro-Russian forces and ethno-geopolitics. The denigration of national identities and the promotion of anti-US, conservative, orthodox, and Eurasianist values. They can also establish alternative discourses to confuse decision-making where it is required and act as destabilizing forces by uniting paramilitary groups and spreading aggressive propaganda. This is everything that's happened in Eastern Ukraine. Right. I mean, this is this is exactly what we see in Donbass. And here I have another website um, that just lists 
it's it's a bullet pointed list of NGOs, pro-Russian NGOs, just operating in Crimea alone. And well, first of all, it's pro-Russian political parties. Um, so it, it's even more direct to non-governmental organizations. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven listed there. As we scroll down, pro-Russian NGOs active in Crimea alone. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And it, none of these are mentioned in this part of the Oliver Stone movie, because again, if he if he mentioned this, uh, it would undo the narrative that he's trying to promote. And again, the, the reason for talking about all these Russian NGOs, and, and there are many more, we can spend more time on it, is because around the 31 minute mark, we had this investigative journalist talking about how some NGOs are funded by government entities and work on behalf of the government. And the way that Stone uh, constructs this narrative is that these NGOs helped to incite the Maidan protests or radicalize people who had previously been engaged in a peaceful protest, that they were essentially um, being funded by maybe the alphabet agencies in the US or US government. And that's, I mean, whatever, that's fine, right? But what this investigative journalist, nor Oliver Stone uh, leaves out is the fact that Russia doesn't just do this via nuance, which is what he's talking about, that there are some NGOs that become funded by governments, that there are literal government fronts from the Russian government that are portrayed as NGOs. It isn't that they're getting fun. It, it's not this trickle down funding or something like that. It, it's literally, they're part of the, the organs of government. And the fact that that's left out is egregious. As mentioned before, it's because he's lying to you. I almost didn't include the social media part of this. I mean, Oliver Stone includes it because that's part of his conspiracy about Maiden, but um, I think we all know that Russia engages in propaganda via social media. I, I almost don't feel like it's necessary to go in depth, but I will because there are a, a few specific cases um, to counter what it was that, that Stone included. During this section, I did question whether this might be um, an age gap or, or whether or not Stone was just kind of willfully being um, hyperbolic and biased. And I say that because the way that he portrays social media, um, basically just, just simple straightforward social media campaigns is he, does, he, he makes it appear as if it's diabolical or a conspiracy. But what he's really talking about are just social media campaigns and it, it's pretty basic stuff. So I don't know, I, I don't know if it's an age gap and maybe a misunderstanding of just kind of regular usage of something like Twitter versus um, trying to fit this into a narrative um, to build up events before Maiden to, to delegitimize it. But um, regardless, let, let, let's talk about it, even though I'm, I'm fairly certain you all would agree that yes, Russian government engages in propaganda online. Um, one of the biggest entities connected um, to this type of trolling is the Internet Research Agency, the IRA. Um, it is funded by a Russian oligarch who works to conduct intelligence operations, military activities, and influence operations globally on behalf of the Kremlin. He has also been linked to financing and direction of the um, Wagner Group or Wagner Group. I talked about that group in depth when we were in the video about Russian extremists in Donbass. So here, here's a screenshot of that. Russia's extremists in Ukraine, Nazis in Donbass, domestic and trans transnational terrorism threat monitor it talks about the Wagner group. I won't go into them here. They're horrible. Um, there are subdivisions such as, such as Special Task Force Ruzik who have just psychopaths, you know, uh, guiding them, literal neo-Nazis, people with Nazi tattoos. Everything that basically Russia says Ukraine does is, is encapsulated in this group, which is a paramilitary private group funded by the Russian government. So getting back to uh, this agency that is, is more direct to what we're talking about. Um, the building that you see on the right is, is an actual place of employment. So this is not a conspiracy. This is a job for people. 
uh, it, it states that there are more than a thousand employees at the IRA. Um, they reported to this building in, in 2015. In the beginning of uh, 2014, there began an organized online campaign to shift public opinion in the Western world in a way that would be useful for Russian authorities regarding the Russian military intervention in Ukraine. So that does what Oliver Stone claims the US and, and, and NGOs and social media people were, were doing with Maiden. Um, there you go, Russia was doing the same thing. Hacked and leaked documents from that time contain instructions for commenters posting at websites such as Fox News, The Blaze, Politico, uh, Politico, et cetera. And it, and it basically gave them a quota. Um, the requirements of the working hours for these employees uh, included 50 comments under news articles per day. Um, each employee had to manage six Facebook accounts. They had to post at least three posts every day and participate twice in group discussions. Other employees had to manage 10 accounts on Twitter, publish 50 tweets per day. Journalists concluded that um, this was indeed run by the Internet Research Agency. So, you know, there you go, right? I, I'm not going to like go away in depth because I, I feel like it, it, I feel like if you deny that that Russia is engaged in this, that you're just kind of willfully being biased. Um, I, I mentioned IRA specifically because of the 2014 campaign um, targeting public perception about Ukraine. This was an interesting site that I found, multimedia platform of foreign broadcasting of Ukraine. It's not in English, so some of the, um, some of the language is a little messed up with, with translation. But basically, it's the, this is an account of an individual who traced a Russian troll on Facebook and looked at the different groups that were created by this person and how the person changed their biographical information, et cetera. And this was really interesting because it talked about a third Maiden. So it starts off the true history of network political technology of the creation of the third Maiden. The idea of this material arose when I accidentally went to one of the Facebook accounts with the name All on the Maiden. I was looking for a schedule um, for how to celebrate the second anniversary of the Maiden and wanted to know if there is such a group on Facebook. Um, and then he, they found this other thing, which, which you know, they say was interesting. Um, the person that they're following's name was Stefan Mazara, but who knows if that's, you know, it's probably a fake name, but it's an anti-Ukrainian content generator. Um, it states on the top, I found this group, but after reviewing the account, um, they shuddered at how um, confidently its creators pumped the audience with hatred for Ukrainian authorities. Each message bore contempt for any branch of the Ukrainian government and called for violence and a third Maidan. So this was a, a, an attempt to delegitimize the Poroshenko regime that, that came to be after the next election post Maidan. And so they're, they're talking, they, they talk about exactly how they came to, to see this. I have, uh, there's some screenshots here um, there, there's a individual with a shape with with short hair, like shaved hair, and um, a Ukrainian symbol shaved into the back of it, along with this angel with the colors of of the Ukrainian flag. Uh, it says on different accounts, Stefan Mazara gives different information about himself. At times, it's contradictory and confusing. On various accounts, anonymous pensioners um, were were claimed to have taken. Or, or were have claimed to have taken their own lives because of poor power with the Poroshenko regime. There were reports on totalitarianism of the new Ukraine. There were calls for revenge. There were fake reports mixed with some real critical materials of Ukrainian media. And that's um, a key to any type of propaganda. You need some, some truth in there so that when people fact check, um, it's murky, it's not completely a lie. There were manipulative polls on the topic of eliminating Poroshenko with predictions by fake experts about the complete failure or even the disintegration of Ukraine as a country. It goes on to say, in the language of experts, this would be called the formation of powerful destabilizing content in order to transform the public space with an attempt to set the socio system in motion. And in the language of non-residents, an attempt to organize a third Maiden 
which would bring all it dissatisfied from the online to the square and lead to the storming of administrative buildings in order to overthrow the constitutional order and create chaos. Um, so th there are other names of these groups. Patriots of Ukraine is interesting because that is essentially the origin group of the Azov Battalion. But um, I won't read through them all. There, there's more screenshots. So, I mean, this is interesting. It, it, it's, it's long. You know, it, it goes through some some other things, but it's interesting because there there are screenshots, right? Um, the individual is identified, and it, it it goes directly. I mean, basically, this just shows that Russia was doing exactly what Alverson was claiming everybody else except Russia was doing. So I'm going to move on from this. This was inter it, it's an interesting read, you know. So if if you look up. Uh, any of the, the keywords from this, I'm pretty sure you can find it. Again, it's not, um, a, it's not an English site, but you can translate it. I think that those two examples are important because, I mean, yeah, you know, we all know Russia conducts propaganda, but th this was specific to changing opinion about Maiden. And that's what Oliver Stone is claiming, you know, that the West did, um, leaving out the fact that, yeah, Russia did the same thing, right? So here's another article from globalvoices.org. Russian social networks dominate in Ukraine despite the information war. So this is from September of, of 2014. And this is interesting because it talks about the social media platforms actually used in Ukraine. And in the movie, Stone really focuses on US-centered social media platforms. Um, and I think Twitter. I, I, I'm, I'm, this is from memory, but I believe it was Twitter that he was focusing on for a specific campaign. But regardless, um, this is just interesting because it, it shows that when we look at you know, who's using what in Ukraine back in 2014, that Twitter and Facebook were the smallest companies. Um, VK was, was the largest by, by far, by far. Um, and this is just interesting because these are not Western owned companies. So the vast majority of the people in Ukraine at the time of the Euromaidan protests were not using Twitter or, or Facebook. They were, they were using VK. Um, we can uh, read here. I'm just going to use the VK. VK leads the charge with 27 million Ukrainian users. Um, the second, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it's also not Western boasts 11 million Ukrainians, while Facebook recorded 3.2 million users from Ukraine, a million more than 2012. So there, there were more, but it was still 3.2 versus 27. Um, Twitter, according to Yandex blog, has 430,000 Ukrainian accounts, um, and it did grow during the time of Maidan. However, it was still far, far less than 27 million. So I think that what we have here, and, and I'm not even sure if Stone was, was going, was getting this specific, but what we have here is an increase in Ukrainians using Facebook and Twitter, and that's true. And so if I tell you that, that, that creates one story, right? However, when you put it in context, there were 430,000 Ukrainians using Twitter versus 27 million using VK, which is centered in Russia. So I, again, I'm just, this is to provide context, right? The, the, the vast majority of people using social media at the time of Maidan in Ukraine were using um, these social media accounts that were essentially Russian owned. And so there's much, much more, right? But I, I, I think that, I mean, just showing the who was using what, right? Most, most, the vast majority of people were not using Twitter or Facebook. They were using VK, which is a Russian company. Um, that Russia does engage in the same stuff that Oliver Stone claims that you know the, the West was doing, specifically, not just in general, but specifically to target and sway public opinion and confuse people, et cetera, create unrest regarding um, Ukraine. Uh, I'll, I'll end with this one because this is this could be, and maybe it will be one day, but this could be a whole 
video in and of itself, Russian disinformation about Ukraine, of course. But I think that this one's interesting for you all. Um, emails link Kremlin troll farm to bizarre New York photography exhibit. So this was, uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole article. This was on Gawker. But um, it, it shows how this uh, paraphernalia was, was posted and that and, and how people traced it back to a Russian troll farm. But um, I'm showing this more for people who might be watching this video because I think that th this is very pertinent to another topic too about alt imperialism. And I talked about that in the video about Nazballs. Um, but I, I think that the material here is interesting because it says um, Syria, Ukraine, who's next? Unique footage, artifacts, and video filming from the countries the whole reality about the countries involved in civil war. And I think that this is particularly interesting because a lot of these alt imperialist figures, these people that are posting things, you know, maybe in support of dictators or denying genocides that occurred and, you know, bashing LGBTQ rights and saying things like, you know, universal human rights are, are globalist imperialism, um, mimicking Alexander Dugan, all, you know, all these people that, that I mentioned in, in that Nazbol video, a lot of that started with Syria and Russian disinformation campaigns regarding Syria. So this was just interesting because I think that um, you all might have encountered things like this, where the, the people were talking about events that occurred in Syria and then events that occurred in Ukraine and moving forward, Yemen is, is another kind of like a hot topic for these folks to use. Um, and of course, there's always Venezuela and, and you know these, these other kind of tried and true countries, but uh, I'm showing you this specifically because of Syria and, and just to show how, how long I suppose that this, can't, this, this Russian campaign has been happening, how it includes other countries, not just Ukraine, but also so that, you know, if you see something like this on Twitter, for instance, question the source immediately. It doesn't mean that it's 100% it's inaccurate, but it, it it might mean, there's a good chance that it might mean that this is uh, something from a network that's Russian propaganda. Long story short, basically, yeah. I mean, Russia had NGOs, Russia had social media. All, all the, the whole quick clip um, piece with the, dr the dramatic music to show this um, crescendo, I guess, to, uh, of, a, of a menacing conspiracy by the West and Maiden, it's just, this is what governments do. And, and I think we have to have like an honest discussion about Russia did the same thing. Russia did the same thing because there were specific outcomes in all these events in Ukraine that would help Russia, right? The US probably did engage in a lot of this stuff because there are certain outcomes that would um, benefit the US as well as the EU, right? And this is reality. It's not a conspiracy. We all should be aware that this stuff is happening. And that's where I kind of land on the on the Newland call. Um, this is one that that's often cited as evidence that the U.S. was directly in, involved in a coup to install a puppet regime. And while again, I have, I'm sure that the U.S. was trying to influence the outcome, and so was Russia. I mean, grow up, right? It's if this stuff is surprising to you. I, you know, um, I guess welcome to the real world. But it does go too far. It does go too far in, in, in Stone's propaganda. So, you know, let's talk about Newland and, and then we'll talk about transition to power. And we'll talk, honestly, there could be a whole separate video on what is a coup to be, because there, there is that as well. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get to that. But okay, so what was the Newland call, if you're not aware? It was a recorded phone conversation be between Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pryat. It included a discussion of who would be best to fill the role of the next Ukrainian president. Um, it also berated European powers, resulting in an official apology. And after looking at this, kind of trying to look at this objectively, one, I get how this looks bad. Um, and if this were um, Russian officials talking about 
who would have been best to fill the presidency post January 6th insurrection, I would think that a lot of Americans would probably feel the same way as many people, maybe you know, on the left with good intentions or, or conspiracy theorists, um, feel about this kneeling call with Ukraine. I, I, I get the connection. You know, I don't think it's crazy. But also, that being said, um, it's really a whole lot of nothing. It's really these two people talking about who they think would be best. And um, the really, I think the biggest impact of this. Well, there were two. There, there were two kind of lasting impacts, right? And neither of them influenced what happened in Ukraine. But one of them is that it made the U.S. look like it was directly involved in choosing people, which helps Russia. So this is great for Russia. Um, but two, Newland also just berated Europe and um, created friction between, specifically, I think uh, Germany and the United States. So again, standing back and, and looking at this objectively level-headed, it's not great, but it doesn't prove anything. And the, the, I think that the, the most impactful result of this was really the United States having to apologize to an ally in, in Germany. But, but let, let's, let's run through the, some of the notes that, that I had. Um, it, so this is a phone call again by Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pryatt. And it was important um, because it, 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 it appears as if these are American officials trying to lay out a transition of power. Even the investigative reporter in the Stone film says that he isn't claiming the whole US government feels this way and that this was just between two officials. Even the guy that Stone paid couldn't say that this was like, you know, causative. But anyway, so what was said? Well, um, it was the Assistant Secretary of State and the US ambassador to uh, Ukraine. And they were talking about who they um, felt would best fit um, to lead this, this new regime in Ukraine. In their view, um, it was uh, uh, one individual as opposed to another. We'll get into that when we talk about transition power. So in Russian propaganda in some alt, -imperial, alt imperialist RT media type spaces, Duganist networks, this has been conflated to mean that the U.S. handpicked the country's next leader, um, except that it, it really didn't. In fact, the biggest fallout from the call in tangible terms was the U.S. government having to apologize for Newland's bashing of the EU. Angela Merkel, uh, Chancellor of Germany, made a public statement calling the conversation unacceptable. It was embarrassing for the U.S., and that was kind of it. So I feel like even the reporter uh, who I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I, I, he, he's done some good reporting in the past. I'm not going to bash him. Um, even he was saying, like, it's not great, but so what? <laughs> it's not. Uh, and I'm going to kind of leave it at that. Um, but I, I will counter it. I'm not just going to say big wolf. Um, I, I can counter it with other things. With, you know, that's kind of the, the exercise that we're doing here. So, so let's move on and, and, and do that. This is from, uh, again, another foreign um, uh, website translated, so things might be a little mixed up. But the title is Yanukovych in Minsk, Kremlin wants to make him president of Ukraine per sources from 2022. And here is Yanukovych uh, meeting with Putin in Minsk. Um, fugitive President Viktor Yanukovych is currently in Minsk. And the Kremlin is currently preparing him for a special operation, according to Ukrainian intelligence. So, you know, I'll go down. Um, you, uh, the source is UP Interlocutor in Ukraine Intelligence Details. It is noted that according to one of the scenarios, um, they, Russia, will try to declare him, Yanukovych, president of Ukraine um, in Minsk. The information obtained indicates that the Kremlin's possible preparation of some information operation or action to return ex-president Yanukovych to Ukraine or publish an appeal on his behalf to the Ukrainian people in the near future. So it's leaked information from this meeting that occurred in Minsk. I'm just showing this because, yeah, you know, the, the U.S. had, I'm sure that they wanted um, a certain outcome. And guess what? 
Russia still wants a certain outcome. This is 2022, right? They want Yanukovych in power. They always did. And that was the impetus behind a lot of these protests, not just what was in literal association agreement, you know, verbiage. It was a fact that it wasn't a secret Yanukovych was in Russia's pocket and people in Ukraine wanted to be independent from Russia. I mean, and that's kind of the long and short of it, right? So I'm not even gonna go down this anymore, but I, I, this is the, the counterpoint to the Newland call, I'll say that. Moving on to a topic that I think, honestly, the, the, the last few things that we just talked about, I feel like you shouldn't, I mean, people know it, it's kind of common knowledge and if people are diminishing it or ignoring it, it's, it, they're just biased, you know? But the, the, the transition of power is important and it might be something that people don't know much about. What's focused on in the Stone movie is uh, the, 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 what it does is it, it, it tries to say that there are um, extremists um, at Euromaidan that escalate things. And because of that escalation, there's more public backing for the protests, which ultimately um, could have been resolved. And um, Yanukovych could have stayed in power. It shows Yanukovych attempting to be reasonable and moderate while the Maidan protesters were not because they were, you know, all Nazis, of course. And that um, in fear of his life, he had to leave, uh, he had to, to leave Ukraine, flee to Russia, that he was still and is still the legitimate um, president. And he is legitimate because there was no um, following letter of the law constitutionally, there was no impeachment. So that's the um, that's the story, right? And and, and it, it goes further, I suppose, to justify um, Russian invasion by claiming that the government is not legitimate. So Russia is not attacking Ukraine. Russia is attacking this coup government. And um, there's one piece I think of truth in all of that, and, and and we'll get to it. But the rest of it. Uh, I, I think we, I don't know, I think it's pretty much false, you know, I don't know that's like questionable. Um, there, there is one piece that, that we'll talk about, though, that, that is accurate, and we'll just need to decide what that means. But um, so talking about the transition of power, uh, there was no impeachment. Let's begin with this, okay, and, and we're going to stay here for a second. There was no impeachment um, because he fled. And, and Okay, so like, let's wrap our minds around that. What does that mean? It, it, it means that there, there, it wasn't that there was a no confidence. It, it wasn't that there was going to be a no confidence vote. It was that he abandoned his position and that it needed to be filled. Now, okay, and, and that, you can debate that, right? You, you can debate that. And we're going to talk about him fleeing in, in a second, right? Um, but for now, let's just stay there, right? It's like Richard Nixon, right? Richard Nixon was going to be impeached and he stepped down, right? He, 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 he left. So he wasn't impeached because he left. That's what the argument here is for Yanukovych, right? It's that the dude just fled the country. And so he abandoned his position. I want to pause there because there's, there's, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about some context with that. So let's do that now. I think that this article is pivotal to continue the conversation. That's why I left the slide and I moved here. So uh, again, another foreign <clears throat> source of the, um, the translation might be off. Vladimir Lukin, President Putin's special envoy to Ukraine, refused to sign an agreement to resolve the crisis in Ukraine. In an interview with Spiegel magazine, he told us why he did. This is vital to um, setting the stage to get an idea of where Yanukovych was at mentally, emotionally, and also kind of how Moscow was viewing the situation and, and for, in which he eventually fled the country. Um, so the first question, 
to the, to the Russian special envoy to Ukraine during this time. Spiegel Online, what instructions did Putin give you? It was important for Russia to maintain negotiation relations between the legitimately elected President Yanukovych and the opposition in order to stop chaos and illegal actions. What do you see as the cause of the bloody crisis in Ukraine that led to the fall of Yanukovych? Lukin, a classic revolutionary situation has arisen in Ukraine, which is explained by the general situation in the country. The people stopped trusting the government, Yanukovych. People were dissatisfied with their lives and there was huge corruption. There's, you know what's, that's why this is amazing. This is the Russian special envoy during this time negotiating with Maiden and Yanukovych. And you know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say coup. He says that this was a classic revolutionary situation. And, and I'm, we'll get to that, right? But without any back, I mean, that's just to me amazing that that's what he said, okay. Um, Spiegel Online, in Moscow, they often talk about America's long arm and that the United States is to blame for the um, coup in Kiev. In the West, many blame Moscow for the Kiev massacre. Lukin, I don't believe in cheap conspiracy theories. Let me go back. The Russian special envoy to Ukraine who negotiated with Yanukovych and Maiden says, I don't believe in cheap conspiracy theories. Okay, he goes on to talk about, yeah, right, there, there, are, there are other elements, but just the, the honesty in this is amazing, it's, it's amazing. Okay, um, what was the atmosphere in the presidential palace when you came to talks after midnight? So this is, what, what was the environment when, when he went to talk to Yanukovych? Lukin states, they had a hard time hiding the panic. So there was panic in the, in the Yanukovych camp. He goes on to say, um, he, he's talking about, uh, well, uh, here I'll read, okay, Spiegel Online, why did you initialize the agreement between Yanukovych and opposition, but then refuse to sign it? Th this is what Yanukovych was saying that he thought everything was gonna be okay, basically, right? That, that he thought he negotiated with Maiden and that then they changed their mind. Well, okay, let's look at this. I initialized it, in the first hours of February 21, I thought the agreement was a good compromise plan on paper. I thought it would force President Yanukovych and the Maidan movement to seek a peaceful solution worthy of a democratic country. The very next day, however, I realized that President Putin and Foreign Minister Sergei um, Lavrov were absolutely right in refusing to sign it. He goes on to say, why, why were they correct in not signing this agreement? Because Yanukovych, under the influence of rumors and reports about the excesses of activists from the Maidan, packed his bags and left. In retrospect, it is seen that Yanukovych's hasty flight and opposition protests have led to a situation where it seems that they have been spat in the face. As a result, we now have a brutal, senseless, and fractal civil war in Ukraine. So. What does this mean? Stopping here. It means that the special envoy from Russia first recognized this as a revolutionary situation, said that he was going to support this agreement, however, refused to sign it. And he says now that he was justified in doing so because of the panic in the Yanukovych camp and the reality that Yanukovych just fled. Again, what does this mean, drilling down? It mean, Yanukovych thought that Moscow wasn't gonna back him. And so he didn't see any way out. Even if he signed a compromise with Maiden, he's, what did he do to his political opposition? Which prevented the association agreement from moving forward in the first place. He put them in jail. What do you think was gonna happen if he stayed in power without the backing of Russia, without Russia signing on to this agreement? Opposition leaders were going to be freed and he was going to be on, put on trial for corruption or something and thrown in jail. Right? He fled. Right? He was in a state of panic. The Russian special envoy says this, that he was in a state of panic. And there's evidence 
showing that he was planning to flee the country days before he actually did. So the, the notion that the Maidan protesters, you know, went back on their word is, is, is inaccurate. There's video footage in his house of people removing items days before that occurred, right? So, so he knew that this was gonna happen. And I think, and this is an opinion, but it's, it's a mighty coincidence that the moment that Moscow, the special envoy, right, per orders of Putin, said that we're not signing this Maidan compromise, that he knew the jig was up. That there was, the, he knew at that point, even, even if they, even if Ukraine, even if Maidan and, and he came to some compromise that said, okay, we'll have early elections. You're in office for, for three new months. Guess what was going to happen? Yulia or, or somebody else is going to win the next election. He was going to be put on trial for corruption or something and put in jail. And he knew that. And once it was clear that Moscow wasn't going to support him, at least in Ukraine at that, in that moment, he jumped ship. And he had been planning to jump ship before that. Perhaps most telling, though, is this last statement that I'm going to read. Who do you think the or who do you think the Maidan was, right? Or I, I, I think that this is translation asking, why do you think this happened? Lukin, again, the special envoy from Russia, it was an uprising against corruption and oligarchs. But who is in power today? The same corrupt oligarchs and Eastern and Western nationalists kill each other and in large numbers, the civilian population. I mean, I think you can agree with that. You can still disagree with Russian invasion and everything that's happening, but I, th this article is amazing. This individual is amazing. The clarity that's presented here is shocking. It, it, it really is. And so to, to continue with this, I said that there was footage found, right? So part of the transition of power, security footage shows valuables being removed from a, Yanukovych's residency three days prior to the Maidan agreements. But the agreement the, the agreement was signed very late at night. He then fled, um, leaving before police even began abandoning him, abandoning their positions. Russia's special envoy described the panic and paranoia surrounding Yanukovych. I don't. I mean, it's it, there. I think that there's two situations that could have happened. One, Yanukovych planned all of this to happen very late at night so that he could more easily flee the country, and he was planning to flee the country. Again, valuables being removed. This is a YouTube video that, that you can look. It's from security cameras in his, in his house. Um, or that he was preparing for a situation in which Russia was not going to support an agreement between he and Maidan. And that once that happened, once Russia saw Yanukovych panicking and they felt like this wasn't going to happen, once, once Russia didn't back him, that he then fled, if that makes sense. But regardless, I think that there's no situation in which Yanukovych was planning on staying in power, that he, he basically knew that the jig was probably up, which goes back to this idea of impeachment, right? And you can still argue that, you know, maybe he sh they should have gone down the constitutional route, but instead what happened was the transition regime said, the guy fled his position, he abandoned it. So we need to fill it. Now there's questions about how they filled it, and that's fair, right? We can critique that those few days because they were chaotic days. But I do also think that you need to recognize the chaotic days, you know? And less than trying to justify every single um, political maneuver that occurred, I think instead, um, what will, I, I think the better argument, but we'll look at them, but I think the better argument is that instead of a new regime taking place, right? Let's bounce back before I do this. Before there was a, a, a new regime that took power, which often happens in a coup, right? Um, there was just an interim government with future elections slated that did occur. So this, this wasn't, um, first of all, it wasn't, the military wasn't involved. And that's usually what happens, right? With, with some type of coup. Um, there, there, there weren't like social elites that consolidated power and then refused to give it back. That didn't happen either. It wasn't really a revolution in that 
like structural things change. It wasn't like oligarchs were no longer oligarchs, right? For instance, it, it was something of a combination of all of these things. And uh, I think that that vagueness in it makes it easy for propaganda to, to get its, its, its fingers into. Um, because it doesn't, what, what happened in Maiden doesn't neatly fit into any of these um, scenarios. But regardless, and, and we'll go through it all, what, what did happen was that an interim government was set up and then there, there were elections. And then since then, there have been other successful elections too. So, you know, take for that what you will. To me, that's not a regime change with some type of totalitarian government or something. You know, generally with these regime changes, there's like a revolutionary government. And then that, you know, thinking back to like the post-World War II, then that revolutionary government ends up becoming authoritarian uh, as it's challenged, as new generations come about that, you know, don't recognize the initial, the, the, the initial um, revolution and that all that they see is authority at this point, you know, and that, that, that's a whole discussion, right? So, but let's reel it back and, and look at this transition of power here. So um, the argument was that there is no impeachment because he fled. You can debate that, but I mean, he fled and, and he was panicking and Moscow basically lost faith, right? That's what it looks like. Um, Ukrainian border agents prevented him from flying out of the country. So he tried to flee, and he was seen by Ukrainian border agents, and you know they basically prevented him from leaving. I, I mean, this brings, I think of the French Revolution, right? With the king trying to, 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 to flee France and being brought to Paris and put on trial, right? Um, but so eventually he was able to flee though. Um, the Russian special envoy refused to sign any Maiden compromise. After Yanukovych fled, the Ukrainian parliament voted to restore the 2004 constitution. And this is important because for, for a few reasons, but one of them was because leading up to Yanukovych um, fleeing, there were a series of anti-protest laws that aren't discussed in Oliver Stone's movie either um, that, that were put in place. And I'm not gonna go in depth into those, but by reverting back to the 2004 constitution, one of the things that that did was undo all these, these laws that were passed during the Maiden protests, which cracked down on protesters, essentially. Um, the party of regions did not support him. Even Yanukovych says this begrudgingly in, in the Oliver Stone film. He makes claims that they were threatened and maybe, I don't know, I mean, possibly. But you know what we'll see is if they were threatened, they were allowed to stay in office because they're still representatives of, of theirs in office, but that the basic, basically, and Yanukovych himself says that, that yes, there were some people that, that turned on me, right? He sees this as, as um, you know, being unfaithful or something, which is interesting. It gives you insight, it's something like Trump would say, you know, this like this, this, this trust and faithful stuff, um, loyalty. But anyway, the party of regions didn't support him, Right, and, and it continued not to. There, uh, there was no support of the police or military on either side. The official stance by the military specifically was that we stand with the people. And that doesn't mean Maiden. That just means that we're not taking sides politically. Right, so I think you could argue that Yanukovych, you know, did not have the support of the, by the military not doing anything, preventing stuff from happening, that inaction, um, is and you know of itself in, in action. The party of regions voted 94 to one for the Arseniy Yatsenyuk government, right? He was prime minister. And I put here, it, so regardless of what you, you call that, right? There, there, there isn't evidence to suggest that the party of regions was under threat 94 to one to vote for Yatsenyuk. But, even if even if you argued, okay, they were, this didn't result in a coup government regime, right? This resulted in an interim government that was um, that held elections a few months later. Ukrainian military and police leaders said that they would not get involved in any internal conflict, which to me is an action. 
The interior ministry responsible for the police said it served exclusively the Ukrainian people and fully shares their strong desire for a speedy change. The organs of the interior ministry have crossed to the side of the protesters, the side of the people, the new interior minister, Arsen Avakov, told Ukrainian Channel 5 TV. So, what, you know, regardless of the second, the organs of the interior ministry have crossed this side of the protesters. <clears throat> I do think that it's, it's very telling that there, there was essentially no action by the military, the police, and eventually the police who were guarding the presidential palace, for instance, just left their posts, right? So they, they just allowed what seemed to be the inevitable to occur. So let's talk about the, this interim government. Um, I put here a revolutionary coup d'etat because it, it was, again, it, it's, I don't want to go on the, the, the semantic road of what is a coup and what is a revolution. There are people, there are alt imperialists that will say, you know, a revolution is of the people and this is not of the people. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that this was a culmination of a hundred plus years of Ukrainian people seeking independence from Russia. And that that's what this was about. It was about uh, the, the last straw. I mean, that's a very feasible argument to make. However, um, it wasn't um, a revolution in that the, the people in Maiden took power, which, you know, some, if you want to get political science, some, some arguments would, would say that because politicians already in office maintain power, this wasn't truly a revolution. Um, you know, in a way, I think you could also frame it as a revolution of independence. But Whatever you want to call it, I have here this kind of combination of both. You know, it's um, it, it, it wasn't a coup because there there was no consolidation of power per se afterwards. Um, I, I can already see people saying now, but you know that's that's post Ukrainian war. That's a different topic. In 2014, 2015, 2016, right there there was no consolidation of power, um, and there were free and fair elections that were held shortly after. The new parliament was temporary. The new presidential elections were, were set to be held within months. Um, Arsene Yatsenik received 94 votes of 123 from the party of regions faction. The new presidential election held in November resulted in a different candidate being elected, Petro Poroshenko, who is not like a Nazi or some ultra-nationalist. Um, as a matter of fact, he was uh, a part of the Social Democratic Party of Ukraine, which was instrumental in creating the Party of Regions, which was Yanukovych's own party. So I think that this is very telling too, that, you know, one interim government, no, no, no consolidation of, of, of power in that way. Two, an election occurred within a few months. Three, the victor of that election, and this goes back in this political history, but you know, at one point was a member of the Social Democratic Party of Ukraine, and that party was instrumental in creating the very party that Yanukovych was a member of, who also did not support Yanukovych, right? Who ended up mostly the majority supporting um, this new interim government. To emphasize this, because this movie would have you believe that some reincarnation of the, you know, the Bandera group from World War II, which in and of itself was a, a, a fraction of a, of a faction of Ukrainian nationalists, that, you know, that these people were in power now. And, and it's just not, it's not accurate. The, the 2014 Ukrainian parliamentary election results, right? People's Front, so this is um, the, the interim government, um, we have uh, Yatsunek up on top, received 22.14% of the total votes. Petro Poroshenko's block received 21.82. Remember Petro Poroshenko having been part of the party that basically helped create Yanukovych's own political party. Um, and then we have the opposition block, self-reliance. Um, um, Svoboda, which was mentioned earlier, only received four, well, let's round up. It's 4.75% of the total votes. Right sector received 1.8. So very, very small, right? It's People's Front and Petro Poroshenko. And Petro Poroshenko it, it is not some extremist, you know, pro-EU 
nationalist Nazi. It, he, he's not that. Now let's go to 2019. So the 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary election. So up on top, we have SN. Um, this would be Zelensky's party receiving 43% of the vote. And then we go, uh, parties often change, but Petro Poroshenko's party uh, came in fourth at 8.1% um, of the votes. Svoboda had a measly 2.15% of the vote, which is even, which is half of the 4.7 that it had previously. And right sector didn't even, it didn't tally any, any election votes. So this is what happened. This, this is the, the, the post Maidan reality um, in Ukraine in the years 2014, uh, 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 19, right? So, you know, I'll ask, uh, I'm not even gonna make any conclusions or ask you any questions, right? But this is the reality. Oliver Stone painted one picture but he never actually told you what happened. This is actually what happened. So take this for what you will. I personally don't see how you can come to a conclusion that Oliver Stone wants you to after looking at this. This is additional information that I'm adding. I'm gonna keep it brief, but this was left out of Oliver Stone's movie altogether. Events that occurred in Belarus. Um, around and after the time of, of Maidan in, in Ukraine. And I'm going to include it, one, because Russia is currently using Belarus as uh, geographic territory to invade Ukraine. But two, because I think that what we see in Belarus is what Ukrainians foresaw the, in the future for Yanukovych and Ukraine. Without going too far off the beaten path here and making this <laughs> video longer, I, I do think Belarus is an interesting case study. This is from 2020, um, the title of the article, One Week After Election, Belarus Sees Giant Protests Against Europe's Last Dictator. Tens of thousands of protesters took to the streets of Belarus on Sunday in what appeared to be their largest demonstration yet against the widely disputed re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko. Lukashenko has been labeled as Europe's last dictator. He took office in 1994 and has staked his claim in a, in a sixth term after declaring a landslide victory in the country's election last Sunday. Opponents immediately condemned the results as rigged and a wide cross section of citizens have been calling for change at protests ever since. So looking at some tweets from the time, immense crowds, tens of thousands are gathering right now in Minsk. People are still coming. They are protesting against Lukashenko and police brutality. There's no leader, but people are self-organized and peaceful. The plan was changed last minute, but people knew where to come. And there, so there's images, essentially kind of like of a Maid in here, of people gathering to protest. Um, this is an independent square as opposed to, to Maiden Square. So we are power. And we see all these people with Belarus flags. Um, it talks about a smaller counter protest. Uh, this is what the alleged 80% of support to the incumbent Lukashenko actually looks like in Minsk, Belarus now. It's people protesting. So to add a, a wrinkle to this, because he might be saying, well, okay, you know, Bel Belarus is very close to Ukraine and Russia, and uh, you know, they're they're having this um, this this uh, I don't want to say Maidan type of event, but they're protesting, and you know, they've they've had this leader since the the mid '90s, and it's fairly clear that the election results are not what was stated. Um, th so this adds a wrinkle here, Belarus. Ruler Lukashenko says Russia lying over mercenaries. Again, from 2020. Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko has accused Russia of lying about a mercenary group arrested in Belarus last week and says another such group has infiltrated his country. Today we heard of another unit sent into the South, he said, in an address to the nation, and we will catch them all. Russia has denied that the 33 Russians held were plotting terrorism and were linked 
to anti-Lukashenko activities. Anti-Lukashenko protests have grown as he seeks re-election on August 9th. So this is before that, you know, apparent landslide victory. Russia has said the 33 claimed to be members of the shadowy Wagner mercenary group. So we've already talked about them. We're only trans transiting via Belarus en route to Istanbul. So it, right. So what we have here is, is, is prior to the election, Russia had special operation forces, the, the Wagner group, neo-Nazis and other extremists in Belarus. And, and it looks like they're actually trying to get rid of Lukashenko, or at least, you know, sometimes with these, it's just creating conflict. It's just creating a turmoil. There, there is no necessary end goal, but for destabilization, because that alone actually increases Russia's power in the region. However, whatever the purpose, it looks like these members of the Wagner uh, group were caught by Lukashenko. Then we have the um, election, and he wins again, because he wins every single time by 80, 90, 100%. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, and then there were massive, massive protests. So what, what happened after that? What happened after these massive protests? Okay, so um, a, a new article uh, from a little bit later in 2020. Putin says Russia has set up force to aid Belarus leader if necessary. Moscow and Minsk. Russian President Vladimir Putin said on Thursday the Kremlin has set up a police force to support Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko at his request, although it would not be deployed unless unrest there spun out of control. Well, they already had the Wagner group there, so just if be naive. The remarks were the strongest signal yet that Russia is prepared to use force if needed in Belarus where mass demonstrations have taken place since August 9th election that the opposition says was rigged. We have, of course, certain obligations towards Belarus and the question Lukashenko raised was whether we would provide the necessary help, Putin told state television. I told him Russia would fulfill all its obligations. There's more, so wait. New article, title. Lukashenko's brutal crackdown has lethal help from Moscow. An investigation into the suppression of protests discovered the widespread use of Russian weapons. Sounds like Donbass. So this is from a year later. Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko's fraudulent claims of victory in last August presidential election triggered massive protests across the country. After 26 years, uh, well, this is some op-ed here, uh, of miserable ineptitude, repression, poverty, and corruption under Lukashenko, the citizens of Belarus has had enough. The authorities' response was to protest, and uh, the authorities' response to the protests in Belarus was brutal, according to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. More than 27,000 people have been detained and arrested since last August. Hundreds have been beaten and tortured and several lost their lives. Journalists have been especially targeted by authorities. Leading reporters without borders to declare Belarus the most dangerous country in Europe for media in 2020. The security services still known in Belarus by their Soviet era acronym KGB are Lukashenko's only hope for staying in power. But the relic of the era when Belarus is ruled from Moscow isn't the only connection between Lukashenko's violent crackdown and his country's former Russian masters. An investigation by BIPOL, a network of dissident former officers from the Belarusian security services and criminal justice system has documented widespread use of Russian weapons and ammunition used by Lukashenko's forces to put down the protests. This includes many weapons with lethal military capabilities whose use on civilians violates international human rights standards. So, you know, what we have here is um, in, a, in a, an upcoming election, right, for, for someone, um, Lukashenko, who's, whose power is somewhat unstable, um, Wagner Group was found within the borders, operating, creating dissidents and uh, 
you know, just destabilizing. It, it's exactly what Russia did in Eastern Ukraine um, in 2014. Uh, the same, I mean, when I say exactly, I mean the same group, like literally the same group. Um, those people were in Donbass too, a whole other video. You guys can, can watch that. So the same group is found before an election in Belarus. There is this election, it's clearly fraudulent. The guy wins by 80%, he's been in office since 1994. It's not, he, he's, he's a dictator. Massive popular protests occur. And what does Lukashenko do? Well, he falls to Russian pressure, right? He says, yeah, I'll take that money from Russia. I'll, I'll take that special police force that you say you only send when things get bad. Yeah, yeah they were there. Um, we'll take all those weapons from Russia. But, and this is why I think, um, this is where I think um, Yanukovych kind of got in, be, being deposed, Yanukovych saved himself from getting into the situation that Lukashenko is now in. Because when you do any kind of deal with any superpower, right, there's gonna be consequences. And, and what are those, so, so let, let's follow the narrative. So, so now what happened after this? So Belarus, Lukashenko is able to hold on to his, his power with help from Russia. Okay, new, new site. Belarus's role in the war on Ukraine. So this is Belarus now, kind of what we read earlier when, when, when we, we were talking about U Ukrainian opposition, uh, discussing how, um, how people in, in the party of regions and Yanukovych were beginning to get so entangled with Russia when, when they were discussing how Russia was, was, was threatening to, to build pipelines around Ukraine and putting all this pressure on Yanukovych. And this is why a lot of Ukrainians scoffed at this idea of a customs union, because right? it's not, you can get all the nice things in the world. Belarus did too, we'll see after Lukashenko. Uh, began to, to warm up to, to Putin after his last election, where it looked like he might be deposed without the intervention of Russia. Belarus's role in the war on Ukraine. Belarus has been complicit in Putin's invasion of Ukraine, serving as a staging area for Russian military units attacking from Ukraine's north, as well as providing support to the Russian military. Belarus is one of Russia's closest allies, and the autocratic regime of Lukashenko has ruled the country for 28 years, and it's heavily reliant on Russia for its continued existence. Let's let's make this bigger. What does this sound? What does this sound like? Russia has subsidized Belarus's weak economy for decades through low interest loans and steeply discounted gas and oil shipments. To ease the impact of sanctions imposed on the Lukashenko regime by members of the international community, Russia has again provided financial help. Let's go a little bit further here because I have, I have some notes. We'll go back up to the picture. Since the Russian strongman congratulated Lukashenko on his electoral win last August, when in quotes, the Kremlin has been steadily consolidating its grip over the neighboring country. Lukashenko regularly meets with Putin. Official accounts of these meetings invariably mention either a Russian loan granted or extended to the Minsk regime or Russian oil and gas deliveries to Belarus on agreed upon low prices. Probably the most significant trend from last year, albeit far less visible, has been what many experts are already calling a creeping absorption of the Belarus State Security Committee, which still proudly calls itself KGB, by its older brother, Russia's State Security Service, FSB. So the FSB, the Russian State Security Service, is essentially decommissioning and taking over the KGB in Belarus. And we already saw that people who left the KGB in Belarus have talked about how Russia is providing them with ammunition and weapons. 
I, I want to reiterate, I want to say, repeat myself. Probably the most significant trend of the last year, albeit far less visible, has been what many experts are already calling a creeping absorption of the Belarus State Security Committee, which still proudly calls itself the KGB by its older brother, Russia's State Security Services. Russia's ambassador to Minsk is widely believed to have served in both the Soviet KGB and FSB. Everything the Kremlin is doing points toward the goal of Russia absorbing Belarus in some form or another, even though it may officially remain on the map with Lukashenko as its ruler. That's exactly what Alexander Dugan wrote in Geopolitics about what needs to happen in Ukraine. That's exactly what Vladimir Putin wrote in his essay about Ukraine. That's why Putin wants to depose Zelensky and bring Yukashenko back to power. It's not about necessarily the boundaries of Russia absorbing Ukraine. This is about the larger Eurasian imperial project that Alexander Dugan writes 900 pages on trying to justify with multipolarity. That's what happened to Belarus. I have an article here. Belarus admits Russia's war drags on. And this is from May of this year. Belarus's authoritarian president, Alexander Lukashenko, defended Russia's invasion of Ukraine in an interview Thursday with the Associated Press, but he said he didn't expect the 10 week old conflict to drag on this way. Well, this was written a few months ago now. Putin need not repeat a 2014 Crimean operation to annex Belarus. Minsk has already agreed, Lukashenko has already agreed to host Russian military bases in Belarus. Guess what's not gonna happen? Those aren't going away. As well as adopting the ruble as its national currency. That comes from some of these negotiations between Russia and Belarus as Belarus faces sanctions from the international community. And What's happening in Belarus is exactly what people in Ukraine foresaw with Yukashenko or um, Yanukovych, excuse me. That's why people in Ukraine did not want to agree to some type of compromise with Yanukovych. It was obvious what was going to happen. And don't think that even now it's happening because for Russia, th this is all strategic. And again, it isn't like the US doesn't do this with US interests either. I'm not here saying Russia is evil and the US is good. What I am doing is saying that Russia does this as well and Oliver Stone doesn't tell you any of this. And Oliver Stone did not mention anything about Belarus. I'll, I'll give him a little bit of, of, of slack some of these things really ramped up after the, the release of his movie, though. Okay, so, so I'll cut him some slack. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, his movie's insanely biased, but I mean, we'll, I'll, I'll be nicer. I'll cut him some slack. Some of this stuff didn't happen in Belarus till after that movie was, was produced, but it was um, extremely obvious what was going to happen in Ukraine. If there was some type of compromise, Yanukovych was allowed to stay in power there was not going to be a re-election in a few months. Like, if there was, he, if, if there were a, a change, if there were a regime change via elections, Yanukovych knows that he would have been in jail. That wasn't gonna happen. He had already begun setting up anti-protest laws. That was just going to increase. He would have ended up in the customs union. Belarus now uses the ruble. Belarus's special service, uh, 
uh, intelligence services agencies are now combined or mixed with that of, of Russia's. There are now military bases all throughout Belarus and Belarus is engaged in the war against Ukraine now, which is extremely destabilizing for them too. Since that time, there have been multiple um, activists from Belarus who have been arrested. Perhaps one of the better known ones, a uh, Belarus activist arrested after fighter jet intercepts his Ryanair flight. A leading Belarusian opposition activist has been arrested in Belarus after President Alexander Lukashenko ordered a fighter jet to escort his plane to Minsk, according to Belarusian state broadcasting. Um, he was in exile and a vocal critic of Lukashenko's regime. He was detained at Minsk airport and the Belarusian Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, reported this on the Sunday. The original flight route was from Athens, Greece to Lithuania, a path that crossed through Belarus. Just another example, a similar suspicion of interagency cooperation hangs over the mysterious death of Belarusian activist Vitaly Shishov, whom police found hanged in Kiev Park this week. He had emigrated to escape the grim reality of inevitable arrest and possible torture in Belarus. The head of a group helping people who have fled to Belarus has been found dead near his home in neighboring Ukraine. Vitaly Shishov's body was found hanged in the park in Kiev a day after he failed to return from a jog. Police have opened a murder inquiry. Police said they were investigating whether he had been killed and his death made to look like a suicide. Meanwhile, Belarusian Olympic sprinter who feared for her safety has been granted a humanitarian visa to Poland. Mr. Shishov led the Belarusian House in Ukraine, BHU, a group helping people who left Belarus um, where opposition to the government is stifled. He was one of many Belarusians who left the country as the security forces violently suppressed protests following the disputed re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko in August 2020. So I'm done with, with Belarus. I don't want to go too far into it, but I think that Belarus is a case study for people in the West who might not um, have the, the clarity, perhaps, that people in this region do. Belarus is what Ukraine could have been, essentially. This part I find uh, especially egregious in, in the film. This is, uh, it, it's a conspiracy theory called sacred victims. And the idea is that, or the idea that Stone promotes is that these people that aren't connected at all in different situations, different parts of time in history are um, representative of this bigger conspiracy. It, and that conspiracy consists of self-harm or allies harming them in order to promote a cause. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's an ugly idea. I'll put it that way. Um, it doesn't make sense. And you know, we'll, we'll look at the people that he talked about but it's, uh, you know, a lot of this movie is head shaking when you're watching it, just going like, um, like, no, that's not true. That's not accurate. But at this part, I felt a little disgusted because it, 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 it turns, um, I mean, I don't want to say mean, but it gets very, um, there's a lot of vitriol at this part especially as some of the individuals listed here. And the language that's used is also surprising. There's lots of name calling and um, it, it gets, at least the, the half truths and lies earlier on were presented in a somewhat professional way, I guess. It could trick somebody into thinking that this was like an above the board production. But this part, it, 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 gets, um, it gets loose, put it that way. And yeah, there's name calling, slandering, and uh, you know, these accusations that, uh, I mean, they're, yeah, they're just ugly, ugly ideas. Let's start with Yushchenko. If you're not aware, Viktor Yushchenko 
the president of Ukraine after the Orange Revolution was poisoned. He was poisoned by dioxin, which was essentially a chemical used in the creation of Agent Orange. It uh, disfigured his body and some doctors have stated that the only reason he survived was actually because of the deformities, these cysts and extra growths that formed on his skin, uh, collected, I guess, the, the poison in these deposits. Um, I've read different accounts of the amounts that he had in his body. I, I read one that was 1,000. I read one that was 10,000. I went with the one I saw that was in the middle, which was 6,000. So Yushchenko had at least 6,000 times the usual concentration of this poison um, in his body. During the investigation, there were individuals who are in Russia that um, Yushchenko wanted to extradite to be part of criminal uh, investigations, as well as um, an ask for Russia to send a sample of lab created dioxin as Australian doctor or Australian uh, researchers, chemists had found that um, the, the way in which this dioxin uh, was composed that it, it was lab created and Russia uh, did not agree to either of these. Um, Stone implies that this was, uh, this poisoning was done either, I guess, knowingly by Yushchenko or by his allies so that he could win the election. Um, I don't understand this. Uh, Yushchenko almost died. He had pancreatitis. He had intestinal issues. Uh, he is jaundiced because of liver problems. I don't understand how almost killing yourself and then being permanently disfigured wins you something. So, Unless Stone thinks that, I don't know, people within his party wanted to kill him so that someone else could run or for sympathy, I, I just don't see the logic here with this. It doesn't, I, it doesn't make sense. Now, now it, it is true that it's still open. No one knows what happened. It, it seems to have been traced back to a dinner party that uh, included this, only a few people, right? Um, so uh, Yushchenko has gone on the record stating that he believes he knows maybe who perpetrated it. Uh, however, this has never been, there's been no conclusion. There was an article I found from News 24 um, back in February, 2005, that states Yushchenko Russian poison link um, in a bizarre twist to the mysterious poisoning that disfigured the face of Ukrainian President Viktor Yushchenko, investigators in Kiev are probing a new lead that involves a Russian political consultant. Prosecutors are studying an audio tape of a conversation which alleges a role in the dioxide poisoning by Kremlin-connected spin doctor Gled Pavlovsky, a spokesperson for the prosecutor general told AFP. Um, Pavlovsky, a key campaign advisor uh, to Yushchenko's defeated and Moscow-backed rival, Viktor Yanukovych, dismissed the claims as fabricated. The prosecutor has said that he knows whose voices are on the tape, and this is one of the versions that we are working on. However, uh, in, in uh, transparency, this couldn't be proven because they're they are just voices on, on a tape. So um, this is uh, up in the air, and you know I'm not going to say that Russia did it because no one knows who did this or or why. Uh, I find it very hard to believe that he did it to himself, and I don't understand why someone within his party would do it either. Again, it it would mean that he died, and they would have to get a new candidate and essentially have a new election. So they were already in the in the midst of, of a runoff. I don't understand. It just doesn't that that just going down that conspiracy road. It it doesn't even make sense to me as, as a conspiracy. And now you need to fast forward uh, a decade, pretty much, to get to the next person in this conspiracy. Which is why you know it's just it's, 
this, this is one of those things where it's like, do I want to spend time on it? Because it's just, to me, it's ridiculous, you know, but this, this, is what, this is what you have to do. You have to discuss the ridiculous thing. So, so the president of Ukraine was, was poisoned back in, in the Orange Revolution. So now we're, we're going to jump like a decade. And uh, now we have someone else who gets beaten nearly to death. And this is supposed to be part of this like cohesive conspiracy, right? The sacred victim, which is just um, just so dehuman. It, it, it's just gross, it's dehumanizing. And, and the way that um, Stone and, and the director talk about um, Tatiana is really bad. So we have Tatiana Shornovo. Um, the way that the movie describes her, and, and I have quotes here, uh, tabloid writer and political wannabe. Um, it, it goes on to say that she gave the world media a Christmas present in 2013 when she was uh, cruelly beaten by unknown assailants. It, it, it's just hack, man. Like this, I don't know. Like this woman, almost, it, she, she didn't just get beaten. Right, she she didn't just get beaten. She suffered a severe concussion. Right, the the orbital structure around her eye was destroyed. It, it, you know, it's it's not like this was something where she, um, you know, I don't know. She she asked someone to punch her in the arm, and uh, and said that Russia did it or something. It, it, the 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 casual or the the punishment that she endured um, could have put her at lifelong uh, health risk. Put it that way, um, a, a, along with a reconstructive surgery that was necessary, uh, again was the severe concussion that that she suffered. Uh, investigative reporter and participant in the Yermaiden protest campaign. Her car was clipped by another car in the early morning. Men exited and severely beat her. Perpetrators were part of a, an organized crime family. Uh, details about her, including photographs of her and her license plate number were found in Yanukovych's mansion after he fled. Of course, Oliver Stone doesn't tell you any of this. Um, so the idea, I guess, that Oliver Stone wants to portray is that um in 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 his words she's a wannabe and uh that i guess she agreed to get beaten up i mean i i guess or maybe people in the mayan protest said let's beat her up because it'll make russia look bad and it's just i mean it's it, it's so vindictive and messed up but it's not just that she it isn't just that she got like beaten up right it, it, it wasn't it wasn't even that which is in and of itself kind of hard to believe like she wasn't just attacked she had to have reconstructive surgery her nose and her eye orbit were basically destroyed and shattered she suffered a severe concussion like this is not something that was for show this could have had lifelong implications everything from brain damage to blindness so uh, I just don't, I don't get it, man. You know, this kind of, this, this made me feel gross watching it. But here's what was found in um, President Yanukovych's mansion after he fled. And this is up on Twitter. But it's her name, it's photographs of her, and then the license plate to her then vehicle. So I don't know, man. You know, I, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist either. Um, maybe you could say that, well, this was fabricated too. Given the history of Yanukovych and, and how he's handled his political opposition, I don't think that's too far-fetched that he would have organized crime, especially with his the family uh, business going on uh, in, in involving that kind of consolidated business group. Uh, I, I don't think it's ridiculous. I don't think it's any more far-fetched to think that Yanukovych hired some guys in the mob via maybe the family or something to, you know, go silence this woman. I, I, I don't know. But um, regardless, to, to suggest uh, that she did it to herself or that people close to her did it just to make Russia look bad, 
is um, just distasteful. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. It's just gross. And to close this out, because I, I want to just I want to get out of this and get into the Crimean referendum issues with that, and then finish up with the Malaysian flight. Um, kind of like the social media, or yes, the, kind of like the social media part. I also just kind of, I mean, if you're going to create Russian propaganda and, and you're going to attack the West, I, I almost think it's comical that you would talk about, you know, propaganda in social media, for instance, when you're talking about Russia. It's like, it's something I feel like everybody knows Russia already does. You know, it's not a great topic. Um, the sacred victim stuff about like, you know, poisoning, people poisoning themselves or beating themselves nearly to death in order to promote a cause, you know, as opposed to maybe people that just don't like them trying to kill them. When you're talking about Russia, also just leaves me a little, I don't know, just I lost for words. If you're watching the video, I just, I mean, I can make a montage. These are things I grabbed. It's it's just a, a, a number of some high profile cases of people that were poisoned by the Russian government. It's like, it's kind of what they're known for. You know what I mean? It's not something I think like you would go around. And it's if, if you want to put Russia in a good light, this is something that I think you would not talk about. Because even bringing it up, if you're, I mean, and, and you're not talking about Russia doing it, I feel like Russia is kind of synonymous with poisoning uh, political opponents, dissidents, and people that just don't go along with, with their, their program. So, you know, if, if you're not watching this, I'm not going to read through all the names. There's a lot of people, okay? Just go into Google, go into whatever search engine you like, and just look up Russian government poisoned. And you will have weeks of information to look through um, the hypocrisy in the, the hypocrisy of proposing a conspiracy theory involving this stuff when attempting to make Russia look good is just like just ridiculous. It's it's, it's laughable. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're almost at the end of this fiasco. So um, it moves into the Crimea referendum, where the movie states that 96.77% of people on uh, the Crimean Peninsula wanted to join Russia. There's a, a piece after this that has Vladimir Putin uh, kind of hilariously talking about, uh, you know, what is democracy? And um, essentially what this is trying to show is that people want to join Russia because the goal of this is to try to convince you all that Ukraine is not really an independent country and that it should uh, essentially become part of Russia again, either administratively or quite literally. Um, that goes back to the very, very beginning of it. Um, so let, let's get into the, uh, the Crimea referendum because there's some issues with it for sure that of course, you know, Stone isn't gonna talk about. Anytime you see polls released for voting <clears throat> that, that show upwards of 90% approval for something, that sets off alarms for me. And uh, that is, is what happened to me looking at Crimea. Because it, to be honest, Crimea has a unique history. It, it, it truly does. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, complicating factors in. But looking at the upwards 80 to 90 percent choosing to, to join Russia, well, you know, that that made me question some things. So I, I found this Brookings Institute article, Crimea six years after illegal annexation. And going through it, I found one part here that was interesting. The conduct of the referendum proved chaotic and took place absent any credible international observers. That's true. There, there weren't any international observers there. There were reporters and, and people trying to do their best, but there, there were no UN uh, representatives or anything. 
Local authorities reported turnout of 83%, with 96.7% voting to join Russia. The numbers seem implausible, as they should. 83% turnout, 90 plus percent to join. That's questionable. And it's especially questionable given the ethnic Ukrainians and Crimean Tartars, and remember we talked about them, we're gonna talk about them in a moment, accounted for almost 40% of the peninsula's population. So it's almost, almost half of the peninsula's population are a mixture of ethnic Ukrainian people and ethnic Tartar people. And this is claiming that there is 80% turnout with 90, almost 100% uh, to join Russia. It has here in parentheses, two months later, a leaked report from the Russian president's Human Rights Council put turnout at only 30%, with about half of those voting to join Russia. Well, you might say, well, the, you know, I, the, what, what people do, you know, you get the, you get all imperialists and stuff to say, well, the Brookings Institute is a think tank for neocons. Okay. Well, here, here's why I, I do think that there's validity in this claim. And the claim is that it was actually very low voter turnout. It was around 30% per the leaked documents and that about half of those people voted to join. Let's see why that, that voter turnout might have been so low. Well, here's one of the, here's one of the reasons why. Tartars boycott Crimean referendum. Istanbul. Hardly any Crimean Tartars cast ballots yesterday in Crimea's controversial referendum on whether the region should join Russia or remain part of Ukraine. According to the head of the polling, Ala Fedorova, less than a handful of Crimean Tartars turned up to cast ballots, and those who voted were Russians and Ukrainians despite an outcry and threats of sanctions from the West. So essentially what we were talking about before, there, were, there weren't 80% plus voter turnout, right? Almost half of the area is a mixture of ethnic Ukrainian and Tartar people. And the Tartar people boycotted the referendum, which makes it much more likely that the realistic number is probably somewhat more similar to those leaked documents of 30% or so. And this wasn't some social media campaign or something that individuals decided to do. A Crimean Tartar leader announces referendum boycott. Let's go down. The leader of Crimea's Tartar minority has denounced a vote by the territory's pro-Russian lawmakers to join Russia and called for a boycott of a referendum planned for March 16th in which Crimean residents will be asked whether they want to join Russia. There's a whole structure of, of government in Crimea specifically geared or, or for this ethnic population of people who, you know, if you remember, these were the people that the Soviet Union forcefully displaced and then repopulated with ethnic Russians. That was, you know, of course, that the Khrushchev did the nice gift thing where he, he gave this to Ukraine because he's, he's nice. You know, maybe he was nice, I don't know. Or maybe he was trying to introduce a huge population of ethnic Russians into Ukraine, which of course is where we're at now, right? So I have here my notes too. The majority decision negated other factors. The measure to join Russia is expected to pass in the majority ethnic Russian region, partially because the speaker of the Tartar National Assembly who opposes the measure called for a boycott. So the National Assembly, there's a whole separate structure of representation for this group of people in the area. It was founded in 1991 to act as a representative body for the Crimean Tartars, which could address grievances to Ukrainian central governments, the Crimean government, and to international bodies. So they too saw this as illegitimate and did not participate. 
If anything, at least this proves that there, there wasn't 80% churn. It's impossible numerically for there have to have been that, right? Unless every single ethnic Russian and every single ethnic Ukrainian went to vote and almost all of those people voted to join Russia, right? That, that's a very far, that, that's a stretch. That's a stretch. It's much more likely and I don't blame the Crimean Tatar people. Of course, why would you want to? Russia is a country that only a few generations, I mean, it could be these people's grandparents that were put on cattle cars. Why would you want to join Russia? But this whole structure, this whole part of Crimean government was just ignored, which is a piece for why this election or referendum was bogus, right? It didn't address. It didn't even address this legislative body. There's also another problem with this. There was no option to just keep things as they were. Let's explain. Ukraine's secession referendum does not have a no option. No is not an option in the upcoming referendum in Crimea on whether to split from Ukraine. The Crimean parliament which voted to put the question to a referendum Thursday, despite opposition from the new Ukrainian government and from the United States has released a ballot for the March 16 uh, vote on its website. The referendum gives voters in the autonomous region the option to secede from Ukraine and join Russia or return to policies that give Crimea even greater autonomy from Kiev, essentially making it independent, opening the door to join Russia down the line. So there's no option to just stay with Kiev in that current arrangement, essentially. It, it was either basically you become basically independent or you join Russia. There, there's no option to maintain. Now it's more complicated. There's a 1992 constitution, but long story short, there, there was no option to keep things as they were if people liked how things were. Here's a, a, a copy of the ballot. This is from Kiev, Kiev Post. So they, they have an image here uh, of the options. Right? And of course, this is in, in another language. Voters in Ukraine, Russian occupied Crimea who vote in the March 16 referendum have two choices. Join Russia immediately or declare independence and then join Russia. Um, now that's a little bit of, a, of, of editorializing that if they chose independence that they would eventually join Russia. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I believe that if you read between the lines, that's uh, the insinuation, right? The lack of choice wouldn't surprise anyone familiar with how Soviet or Russian elections are run. The Crimean parliament released the design of the ballot that will be used for the referendum, which will be taking place as thousands of Russian soldiers are in control and it appears Russian President Vladimir Putin is calling the shots. Um, so without getting into the complications of, of previous iterations of Ukrainian constitutions, um, what, what, what this is saying, and it's editorializing a bit, is that either join Russia or basically become independent and then you're on your own. So do so willingly or do so the hard way, basically. Along with that, here, let's, I'll, I'll go back up so that we can look at this picture. Yeah. All right. Um, along with that, some, some other things. The referendum violates both the Ukrainian constitution and international law. The Ukrainian constitution requires that any change to the territory of Ukraine be approved by a referendum of all Ukrainian people. So again, this is this is this was not legitimate, regardless of what Vladimir Putin says in, in in that video about you know what is democracy. And over here, the Council on Foreign Relations discusses this: why the Crimean referendum is illegitimate. Um, going back to this uh, this article, and, and you can read it goes in depth discussing what is supposed to happen, which is something of a referendum for the entirety of Ukraine to discuss changes to territory. And 
over the years, without going into Crimean history, uh, Crimea uh, engaged in, in many negotiations with the central Ukrainian government since the 90s to, en to enjoy a lot of autonomy while also still being connected to the government of Kiev. So it's a, it's a very unique relationship and, uh, prior to this. I think that you could say at least, you know, one, that the statistics provided by, by Russia are, are most likely numerically impossible. Um, two, uh, an entire um, ethnic minority who had already suffered abuses from the Russian government in the past were just left out. And, and their function in the Crimean government was ignored. Also, the options that were available did not include keeping things as they were. So you start adding these things up and I'm not here to say that Crimea shouldn't join Russia if they want to. And I'm not here to say Crimea shouldn't be autonomous and independent if it wants to be. I'm here saying that Oliver Stone is lying to you about what happened in Crimea. I have an Al Jazeera article here, Russia's crackdown on Crimean Tartars foreshadows wider repression. Analysts say Russia's treatment of Crimean Tartars indicates likely tactics towards dissent in the newly seized Ukrainian territories. This part of the article discusses um, a Tartar activist who was followed by, <clears throat> by uh, Russian police. Um, she was essentially abducted, bag put over her head, put in a car, brought to an um, undisclosed area, um, was uh, asked questions about a activist organization for which she refused to answer, um, saying that this is still Ukraine, Russian law does not apply. Um, she was detained again for a longer period of time and then eventually let loose. Says analysts say the arrest may give insight into Russia's long-term plans when it comes to the territories it took control of in the past two years and tactics they used to achieve them. Going on, it says, until, until now around 20 people have been disappeared in Crimea. They were abducted by security services and they are most likely dead. It has hugely influenced the morale of the people. Russia's policy towards Crimean Tartars is that of terror. Analysts say that while repression of Crimean Tartars is partly due to religion, it is also because many in the community have protested against the Russian annexation and criticized it in the media. Over the past eight years of Russian presence in Crimea, activist homes have been searched. Almost all independent Crimean Tartar media outlets were closed and local journalists were either forced to leave or change their focus from politics to entertainment. There is full censorship of local media. The politics of Russification have also been in full force. While on paper, Crimea has three official languages, namely Russian, Crimean, Tartar, and Ukrainian, local activists and experts say that schools are discouraged from teaching in Tartar or Ukrainian. Continuing, it states, Karimov says, the policies aim to remove all the traces of Tartar identity and culture and for any civil movements. There are over 100 Crimean Tartars that we consider prisoners of conscience in Russian prisons with long prison sentences. The majority of these people are religious Muslims. There's even more to this story. And forget about all the NGOs that we saw influencing public opinion in Ukraine uh, on Russia's behalf. I mean, that, that was a bulleted list that you had to scroll through because there were so many, which uh, included politicians in the government, in the then party of, of, of regions. So, you know, yeah, everything that, that Stone had stated happened in, in Ukraine was basically happening in, in Crimea. But um, there was also a large military presence. Even Oliver Stone admits this. He, he puts it in the movie because he knew that it was something that had to be addressed, that there were Russian soldiers that were essentially running this. There weren't um, UN or, or any you know, large um, independent organizations overseeing this, this referendum. And part of the reason why all those soldiers were there was because Yanukovych extended um, a naval lease in a port to keep 
um, Russian boats there. Uh, remember, that it's a while ago now in the video, but that was something that his predecessor wanted to, to stop, right? The lease to remain, all those naval boats filled with Russian soldiers. And we're going to get into a figure who played a part in this um, in the next section, the last section of this video. But I will also state this, a term called little green men. Who were the, the, the little green men? Let, let's let's look because this actually pertains to another video that I created. Um, so here I, I I just searched for and and these are some of the things that come up. Little green men, Russo-Ukrainian war. The phrase "little green men" refers to masked soldiers of the Russian Federation in unmarked green army uniforms carrying modern weaponry. Says Seymour. There's images of little green men in Crimea as as well as some more images in in the upper right. Um, these were the unmarked forces that entered into Donbass as well as Crimea prior to Russian invasion to destabilize. So the, these were the people that were there prior to this, this referendum happening. So who, who were a part of, who was in, in these, who were part of, of these little green men? Um, well, it's a good question. What I do know is that some of them were extremists. And that goes back to the video, Russian extremists in Donbass, um, not, you know, uh, Russian Nazis in, in, in Ukraine. So you have the Wagner Group, um, Task Force Ruzik, uh, and then all these paramilitary groups, uh, Russian Unity, Russia Imperial Movement, all these extremist groups, some of them overtly neo-Nazi, operating openly um, in St. Petersburg and Moscow, being allowed to operate by the Russian government and being used specifically in the war in Ukraine. Uh, one article discussed in, in that video even asked uh, the question during an interview, why, why does Moscow allow these organizations uh, to proliferate or, or why aren't these people arrested, you know? And, and part of the answer was that, well, they're, they're given some prestige because they're seen as veterans of the war. So Oliver Stone doesn't talk about this. I, he, he does address the official military that was there. He doesn't talk about the paramilitaries, the extremists, the terrorists, the people that go in and destabilize prior to, whether that's the Wagner Group or Task Force Ruzek, a subsector of that, or just an, an, an overtly neo-Nazi group like RIM. And that leads us to an individual who has uh, some pseudonyms, but officially um, Igor Gherkin, top military figure in the Donetsk People's Republic in Eastern Ukraine is seen in 2014. He has praised a Russian group for its designation by Washington as a terrorist organization. And this is gonna bring us nicely into the, the next section of this. So, so why, why am I talking about this figure? Well, this figure was instrumental in the military action um, of annexation of Crimea, Igor Gherkin. He was heavily involved in that military operation. He also became a leader in the breakaway Donetsk People's Republic government. He also openly worked with terrorist organizations here saying that the Russian group designated as the terrorist organization by Washington, congratulating them for that. He was also an individual, individual that was um, uh, identified as very likely having been involved in the downing of the Malaysian flight, which is going to transition into the last part of this. So uh, a screenshot. Um, the designation for RIM, Russian Imperial Movement being terrorist, um, also comes amid concern over increasing violence by far-right groups as militant Russian ultranationalists dream of creating a worldwide movement. Putin is openly talking about this now, right? One of the first to congratulate the organization after the US terrorist designation on April 6th was Igor Gherkin, a former Russian intelligence officer charged with the murder by Dutch authorities in the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 in 2014. Gherkin also faces sanctions 
imposed by the United States and the European Union. Doesn't that just, I mean, gosh, doesn't that just put a nice bow on destroying this thing that Oliver Stone created? I mean, it's so, the, the, the ending is so bad of the, of the movie. You know, he, he gets into this conspiracy. He's showing stuff from like the Reagan era. And it just goes, it goes full and, and uh, you know, I guess I'm going to insult. It, it goes full boomer. It goes full Cold War. He's, he's looking at, at the, the countdown clock for, for, you know, the end of the world or nuclear war. And it's just so detached from the current reality. This was stuff that, like, I saw as a very, very, very young child. Right. It'd be on after like the Nostradamus special about how the dragon from the Middle East was going to rise. And it was Saddam Hussein, you know. He tries to make this thing about a, an, air, a, a, an airline flight uh, issue that, that being shot down between Russia and the United States like 40 years ago with this. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the guy who was who was pointed out by people actually investigating this, Dutch authorities, is the same guy that led the military effort to annex Crimea, <clears throat> who is the same guy who's working with Russian terrorists and neo-Nazis in Donbass. And Stone just like ignores it. <laughs> he just, pff, whatever, right? It's, it's just like, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's mind blowing. It's my. It's mind numb. It's mind numbing. I, I don't have the words to correctly say this. Um, this is from the. If you want to know more about Igor Gherkin and what he did in Donbass and Crimea, along with these these neo Nazis and other extremists, check out my video. Um, it's on the channel. Uh, here's a, another screenshot from that. This is from Stanford.edu. Uh, so um, the. RIM, just to let's wrap this up. The organization in question is an extreme right white supremacist organization based in St. Petersburg um, in 20, uh, 2002. It maintains contacts with neo Nazi white supremacist groups across Europe. Um, the group provides paramilitary training to Russian nationals and people, bad people from all over the world. Uh, members of RIM's armed wing, the Imperial Legion, have fought alongside pro Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine and been involved in conflicts in Libya and Syria. You'll also see alt imperialists talking about sometimes Libya, but more so Syria and, and all the Russian propaganda surrounding that. In addition to its ultra nationalistic beliefs, RIM is known for its anti Semitic and anti Ukrainian views. So let's just bring it full circle, right? This started out with Oliver Stone saying that. If you're if you're a Ukrainian nationalist, you're a Nazi. Well, okay, cool. Let's just wrap it up then at the end. The last point that Oliver Stone is trying to make between this boomer 1980s Cold War scenario that he's trying to shoehorn into this film at the very end, that the key figure in that is actually working with an organization who trains neo-Nazis that's known for its anti-Semitism and its anti-Ukrainian views, right? I mean, just beautiful, just apps. I just don't even know what to say. Here again, same, same video. Um, this is the head of an anti-extremist organization based in Moscow. This is what I was talking about before. When asked, why are these people allowed to operate? Why aren't they arrested? Why aren't they arrested? He says it's a mystery, but suggests that the government might be tolerating these mini militias as a mild way to adopt Donbass veterans without disturbances. Because these are people that Russia sent into not only Donbass, but also Crimea to destabilize it prior to all these dressed up referendums where 90 plus percent of the people. It, it's like the election in Belarus. Yeah, sure. Right. 90, 80 to 90 percent voted for Lukashenko. Yeah, right. And here we go. So his, the Igor Gherkin, he, he has a few other names. Here's one, um, but I, I have some stuff highlighted here. Um, after a failed uprising, this is talking about region in, in Donbass, um, and even appearances of so-called tourists, those are the little green men, burly Russians 
brought in to provide the support they could not get from local Ukrainians failed to achieve Moscow's aim. Uh, it was only when Igor Gurkin, a Russian former FSB officer, and his heavily armed and trained men arrived in um, Slovensk in April 20th, 2014, that parts of Donbass fell to Russian and Russian-controlled militants. Igor Gurkin, Ukraine rebel linked to firing missile at Malaysia Airlines plane, death toll 298. So I'm not gonna add any more to this. It, um, Oliver Stone did a disservice to his propaganda piece by even attempting to include this into it. He didn't think about it. Uh, it's it's self-defeating, essentially. All right, this was a long one and I'm tired. If he made it this far, good for you, congratulations. You deserve some type of uh, cer uh, certificate. Um, Unfortunately, and, and, and this was not that even this length of video did, did a disservice to all the lies and half truths and and propaganda in this film and the just the untold damage that's done in influencing people um, in a way for which can never be undone. You know, me making this video, if it gets out to a few people and changes their minds, to me that's a victory. Um, you know, believing that any effort at this point, you know, it's it's so it's so out there um, on Twitter and social media that people will just think that I don't know you're some centrist or or you're a Democrat or you're a neolib or or something like that, and they'll just argue with you. They're not going to listen to you. You know, pe people are just set in in their their minds are made up, and and it's not going back, unfortunately. But hopefully, for some people, um, this provided a service, and I do want to. Um, reiterate, none of this suggests that Ukraine is innocent in anything. There are far-right extremists in Ukraine. This isn't to suggest that Crimea, if it doesn't want to, shouldn't be independent, or for that matter, the region of Donbass either. This isn't created to suggest that Russia is evil and that the EU is like good, right? I mean, really what this is supposed to do is to show you and detangle how this film was a propaganda piece and how it kind of works, how, how that propaganda works. Now this, in, in many ways, I, I could have done a much more simple video because this is a very obvious propaganda piece. And you can tell the way that's organized, the way that's shot, the way that the music were, everything is, is, is building up to certain narratives. The fact that no one was, was interviewed that, that might have provided a different point of view. The fact that only the, basically the head of police, uh, Vladimir Putin and um, the deposed the president of Ukraine were involved in this at all. All right, there, there were, I mean, there weren't even like commentators, forget former elected officials or, or anything involved in this. So I think that this one was pretty, obvious, but it's still useful to really take the time and detangle it because this isn't just about the movie, right? That in, in many ways, Ukraine on Fire has transcended this and it's laid the groundwork for a template for the way that people converse and an understanding that many on the left have of what's happening in Ukraine. And that template is not accurate. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with the United States. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with Ukraine. But if you're ignoring all of this stuff that contradicts the narrative that Oliver Stone and alt imperialists and many people on social media discuss when talking about Ukraine, then you don't care about the truth. You care about being an ideologue and about protecting messaging. And if this is maybe like a light bulb going off in your head. Good, I'm not insulting you. I'm not, I'm telling you that you might have had and you might still have very good intentions. And you might honestly have thought that the things in this movie were true, or at least it was a fairly realistic depiction of what happened. And you might truly think that neocons in the United States and capitalists in Western Europe are attempting 
to homogenize the Eurasian region, bring it under the control of the EU, um, destroy Russia and the idea of multipolarity, and force a global uh, capitalist homogeny. You might really think that, and that's cool. You can you can think that. I mean, it isn't entirely inaccurate. What is inaccurate is the idea that somehow Ukrainian nationalists are all Nazis, or that Ukraine is not a real country, or that Ukraine uh, does not have defined culture and borders, or that Russia is a victim, or that Russia is uh, somehow not the offender in this situation. Russia is on the offensive in this situation. This is part of a larger geopolitical foreign policy scheme to expand Russian power in the region. That's just fact. I mean, Putin will tell you that. He has. Alexander Dugin and books that he wrote that were used in Russian military academy schools tell you that, right? Ukraine cannot exist as an independent country in the region with territorial aspirations, right? It can't happen for Russia. So do with that what you will, right? It doesn't mean that everything is bad. If anything, I think the people who have been kind of marginalized and left out of this entire discussion are people in Ukraine. And I'm not gonna delve into how to resolve that or solve that, but I think it's fair to say that for people living in Ukraine, not government officials, you know, not, not people in the media, that it's been a rough go for generations. And that they've really been the one on the short end of the stick. And you know, a lot of that does have to do with where Ukraine is geographically located. So I'm gonna stop there. It's been a long one again. Thanks for watching. Um, I'll be on Twitter. If you leave comments on YouTube, I will respond. Subscribe. It helps me. It help, helps other people see this in YouTube on the algorithm. Um, and you know, feel free to, to suggest future episodes. I've been focusing a lot on this region. I'm more than happy to continue doing so, but I'm also more than happy to uh, expand out. So go ahead and, and leave a comment. I'll get back to you. Thanks again.